We've seen enough, said Sanguinius. We could spend years going through the archives of this campaign, but I think we've learned what we came here to learn. Is it time for me to receive my judgment then? Mortarian asked. He stared at the angel in challenge. We are not going to clap you in irons. Mortarian looked at the angel with narrowed eyes. That is no answer. That is craven evasion. I hear sentencing in your voice and your words, brother. He moved to the edge of the roof, then turned around to face his judges. No, you are not my jailers. You are my judges, but know this. I am yours. Your hypocrisy is naked before me. Do we understand one another? We do. I have one last question. I still wonder about the complete purge of the Order. There might have been practical value in keeping some of the mid-level functionaries alive. Or don't you agree? I do not. Every member of the Order left alive would be a piece of its structure preserved. Even the smallest fragments of that structure would have been more poisonous than this air. I did not destroy the Order to then permit the possibility that it might take shape again in some way. Horace looked like he was about to say something else, but kept his peace. It's the tally that concerns me. There are millions to work on it. They will complete the task. It is no impossible thing. Sanguinius glanced at Horus, who nodded, looking pained. We agreed, Sanguinius. Are there more questions, or can we say truly that we understand? We can. Very well, said Horus. His face set and grim. He stepped forward. We came to understand, like we said, and now we do. I wonder if you do. No. That is our question. Do you understand what you have done here? I do. I understood it from the moment I undertook this task. The Galaspar you find is the result that I foresaw. It is the correct one. That you intended this does not mean you see it fully. Even you agree with this, Sanguinius? I do. Does that surprise you? It does. Then you do not see it all. And there is something that it is terribly important you will be able to see. There was something in Horus's eyes of the sorrow that had been in their fathers. And that is? The other cost. To whom? To the population of Galaspar. Mortarion grunted in disbelief. They are liberated. Physically, they are. In other respects, they are not. They are traumatized. They have seen death in person sweep through their world. They do not know what freedom is. How could they? Where would they have encountered it? The force that oppressed them was destroyed by a greater one. All they know is destruction. And then there is this tally. They are doing it because it was a command. That's the only meaning they see in it. The meaning of obedience, not the point of the tally itself. I don't know what will happen to them when they are done, and there are no further commands. Do you see? Horus sounded like he was pleading. Liberation is not just the destruction of the oppressor. We can't replace one tyranny with another. Horus paused and his last sentence struck Mortarion like a poisoned dagger. He felt his effect spread through his veins, cold with a truth too large and awful to grasp fully in the instant. This is what our father wants you to see, Mortarion. He wants you to understand the need for nuance in the crusade. You cannot always be the scythe. Look down below, brother. Look at the hills of bodies. You can see them even from this height. Mortarion looked back and down at the distant ground and the mounds of the dead. On them, the people he had freed were moving like maggots on carrion. Counting and counting was that liberation. We can't replace one tyranny with another. The sentence kept echoing in his mind. It set up resonances he did not want to hear. He forced himself to listen to the one Horus wanted him to hear. And maybe Horus was right. Maybe his father's sorrow was right. The look in those eyes. Had there been something other than sorrow in them? 
Had there been the hope that Mortarion would find a destiny richer than the one his first father had bequeathed to him, he shook off the thought and the weaknesses that it came with. He faced Horus again. I see the people of Galaspar. I see what I have done. I would do it again. I have ended the tyranny that enchained them. The tally of the dead is the task of a people who must see and know that their former masters are truly dead. And the cost. Everything has a cost. What do you think would have happened if we had accepted the cost of a blockade and siege? Would the liberty of these people be a sylvan paradise? Perhaps the likes of Rabute would believe in such a vision, but I am no such fool. You are, if you imagine yourself unique in your experience of a lethal homeworld. As you are too, if you think the manner of your conquest has no impact beyond the end itself. You came to Galaspar as the Angel of Death, Mortarion, not as a Liberator. That is the core of the matter. If the Angel was aware of any irony in his words, he gave no sign of it. Does that displease you, Sanguinius? Perhaps it does not. Perhaps it is useful to use me to burnish your own self-image. You broadcast the execution of the Lord Comptroller to billions. You brought death to this world and began what you call its moment of liberation with death. And yet the Eighth Legion spreads terror by any means it can. It has broadcast its share of executions. I have not seen them on trial. Enough! Horus shouted. Enough! He said again, more quietly and with true sorrow. It is all far beyond enough. We have seen enough. We know enough. Mortarion, you have done enough. Horus lowered his head for a moment, then looked up, regretful yet determined. There is compliance here. Instead, there is a wasteland and a population consumed by their fear of the Imperium, of the embodiment of death. Hear me, Mortarion. The conquest of Galaspar will be forever marked as a tragedy of the Great Crusade. It will never be celebrated. It will be the work of generations for the Imperium to undo what you have done here. You are censured, Mortarion, and your first command will be commemorated by morning. Mortarion said nothing. He was calm in his anger. It felt cold as a tomb. He foresaw this too. Farewell, Mortarion. I take my leave of you. Though I doubt you will believe me, I feel no pleasure in this judgment or in the accomplishment of this task. I hope is that when next we meet, you will agree that our decision this day was the just one. The angel boarded the storm eagle. Horus lingered a moment longer. Please learn from this Mortarion. Learn that there is another path for you. Mortarion stared back at his brother, waiting him out. And at last Horus broke with his gaze and joined Sanguinius aboard the gunship. It roared away, climbing quickly. Mortarion stayed where he was, alone with the sepulchre of anger. Jagatai, said the Primarch Mortarion, planting the heel of his enormous scythe into the dust. Mortarion, the Khan replied, nodding in acknowledgement. This is not a your word nor yours, and yet here we both are. If you come for Magnus, he is no longer here. I came to find you, brother. Things have changed. Mortarion smiled behind his mask, making his mottled cheeks crease. I have plenty to tell you, Jagatai. There are opportunities here. The cost of error has never been higher. The rewards beyond imagination. The Khan observed him guardedly. Mortarion had always been hard to read. You are here to persuade me, then? You think after all of this there are any more arguments to be made? Mortarion reached up with his left hand and pushed his cowl back. A pallid grey scalp was revealed, 
though it still bore the noble countenance of the Jean Brotherhood. Deep bags nested under his sharp eyes, and whiffs of gas rose up from the collar around his neck. Listen. Just listen. You might learn something. Even you, my proud brother, can still be tutored. The Khan left his blade unsheathed, holding it loosely by his side. Matarian's power seemed to have grown. Something burned in him, dark like old embers. His flesh was somehow bleaker, his stance a little more capped, and yet the aura of intimidation around him had been augmented. Back on Olenor, even at the height of triumph, he had not had quite the same heft. The Khan recalled his brother's words. What would be the wager on us, brother? What would you pay if we fought? Say what you have to say, said the Khan. Motarian bowed, half mockingly. I have traveled a long way to find you. And now, look around. We have all the time in the universe. All we have left to disturb us are the dead, and they do not stir. Yet, you were not meant to be here. You were meant to join the Alpha Legion at Alaxis. The Khan nodded. Or return to Terra. We did not wish that. Why would we? The Alpha Legion held us at Jondex. They wanted us to hear from Dorn. Motarian raised a hairless eyebrow. Indeed. You surprise me, but perhaps you shouldn't. It seems that Alpharius is never wholly of one mind. He plays a dangerous game. His own intrigues will throttle him. So, are you? Why not me, brother? I assumed it would be Horus. Vanity. He has many things to keep him busy. The Khan's eyes narrowed. Matarian did not seem so sure of himself. For all the show, all the projected force, he was on shaky ground. Horus did not send you, did he? That means nothing. It means everything, said the Khan, studying his brother's reaction. Magnus told me how the war stands. Some souls are still to be decided on. There were always those of us on the edge. I was one. You were another. My legion was at Istvan, so put aside any thoughts that we are not committed. The outcome is already determined, and your choice is simple. Preservation or destruction. Come, Jagatai, you have never even believed in unity. You saw through it, even when Gilliman was lecturing us all to tears, back when there was still Xenos standing between our father and the galaxy's edge. Then tell me the alternative. A galaxy of warriors. A galaxy of hunters, where the strong are given their freedom. A galaxy in which there is no dead hand at the tiller, constraining us, lying to us. And all this led by Horus. He's the start. He is the champion, the sacrificial king. He may burn himself out to get to Terra. He may not. Either way, there will be room for others to rise. Motarian drew closer, and the Khan smelt the chemical tang of his armor. You should never have thrown your lot in with the Angel Brother, let alone Magnus. I hated to see it, the three of you getting dragged in deeper. I always thought you'd break away, see through it, get tired of the hypocrisy. They were never hypocrites. No? Mortarion exhaled a parched laugh. I hoped you'd have understood them sooner. It's the warp, Jagatai. Our father tried to pretend it wasn't there, as if he weren't already up to his elbows in its soul-sucking filth. It should have been cordoned off, put away, forgotten about. It's not for us. It's a sickness, a blight. Motarin became agitated. He calmed down slowly, wheezing through his gas-shrouded mask. The Khan heard a faint hiss and guessed at what kind of suppressants had been shunted into his bloodstream. I see what has happened. Motarin cocked his head. Oh. You were always sincere. I will give you that. You never hid what you wanted. 
I can guess how you thought it would go. First, hobble the sorcerers, silence the witches, drive them out, and the rule passes to the uncorrupted. Healthy. That was your great project. You even told me of it. That day on Ulanor. I thought back then that they were empty threats, but I should have known. You do not make empty threats. As the Khan spoke, Mortarion's mask-locked expression remained inscrutable. Every so often his eyes would go filmy, or his finger would twitch. There was a kind of feeble energy about him spilling out of the cracks just as the noxious fumes did. But it has gone wrong, hasn't it? You have completed your great mission. But there are more sorcerers than ever before. Horus sponsored them. Lorgar has shown them new tricks. If Magnus has not already made up his mind that he soon will, and then you will be surrounded. You have destroyed the Librarius only to find the witches are now untrammeled. They've played you well. You have done their work for them, and soon you will be dragged into it yourself, as warp sick as they are. You think that? I see it perfect. Magnus showed me. Your legend may be free of it for now, but the change will come. You made your packs, and now they will come to collect. You fool. Mortarion stiffened. His eyes blazed with anger for a second, quickly quelled. You do not. And that is why you came to find me. You've run out of friends. Who will stand with you against the Eater Weavers now? Angron? But an ally. Course. Good luck. The Khan gazed at Mortarion disdainfully. You have tasted the fruits of treachery and found them bitter. Don't drag me into your ruin. You are on your own, brother. Mortarion's expression fractured behind the mask, shifting into an enraged snarl, disfiguring rapidly. Silence quivered and he took half a step forward, his free fist clenching. I came to give you a choice, Motarian said, keeping his voice under control with some difficulty. Half your legion are already declared for Horus. The others will follow wherever you order them. Our father's time is over. You can be a part of the order that replaces him. The Khan smiled, a cold smile. Imperious in its contempt. A new emperor. Motarin glared back at him, though he could not hide the doubt. Why not? Why should it not be you? The Khan nodded, finally understanding. Or you? <laughs> Why not indeed? He drew closer, noticing for the first time the discoloration of the skin around the edges of his brother's rebreather. How long had he worn it? I will tell you why. Because we were never the Empire Builders. We were the Outriders. You chafed at it. I embraced it. Motarian began to back away. As he did so, silence crackled into life, sparking with green-tinged energy. The Death Shroud lowered their scythes into combat posture. Then you will not be persuaded. A shame. I invested much energy to save you, brother. 
I shall take no pleasure in your destruction. I have failed my sons! He gave voice to the thought without realizing it, and the Reaper's utterance echoed back at him from the flanking plasteel walls of the warship's landing bay. Guided only by his instinct, Mortarion had returned to where the Greenheart had docked. His shuttle, once battle-ready and primed for war, now resembled a wreck exhumed from some quarry marshed morass. It, like everything in the grasp of this septic reach of the Imperium, was beset by decay. The heavy barriers had sagged under their own weight and cracked open, allowing some fraction of the mind-twisting aurora beyond to cast feverish light into the chamber. In any other circumstance, Mortarion would have expected the bay to suffer explosive decompression, but then this was the war and he was learning that nothing in this place mirrored the laws of the universe he had been born into. The wild glow of the Imperium beckoned him. Out there was the source of his torment, he reasoned. Out there was where the forces corrupting his legion had gathered. Out there was the end point. Mutarin pulled back the hood over his pallid face and cast it away, staring that madness in the eye gathering his strength to step through and confront the truth. His boots rang with the strange echoes as he advanced. The hull of the Terminus Est ranged away from him on all sides, the metal shifting and altering, growing like weeds. The other craft in the fleet hung around him as tarnished ornaments, tethered to a screaming sky of raw, incorrate force. Writhing colors made of delusion and impossible horizons folded away into infinity. But there was one unchanging constant. Mortarion saw the sketch of what might be a god's face. Upon the form of three glaring eyes in a forbidden triad. It was grit by the truth that it had been waiting an eternity for this moment to come. Unbidden. The Reaper of Men's Black and total despair took physical form around him, in a cloak as dark and hollow as the void between stars. The war in his blood seethed, burning him from within. And here, Mortarion's hate and misery, every last iota of his rage and melancholy, took shape in a single demand as he bellowed into the warp. It was a cry of pure frustration. A spear hurled towards cruel fate and everyone who had ever condescended to name themselves as his father. What do you want from me? When the answer came, the buzzing timber and the distant, papery touch of the voice on his flesh was familiar to him. Defiance alone is not enough. Mortarion's heart seized in his chest. He recalled the first time he believed death was upon him upon the blighted crags of Barbarus, and the moment his deepest despair had first showed itself. He failed that day, betrayed his promise to his kindred and his world. He had fallen while another stepped in to take the glory that had been rightly his, and the shame of it had never dimmed. Then, the unfinished words were left incomplete, but now they were spoken in full and the truth the Reaper of Men did not wish to face was made undeniable. To defeat death, you must become it. To endure beyond all, you must submit. If you wish to be granted deliverance from your agony, you must surrender your soul. I remember, do I? Is anything in this place real? Two parts of Mortarian spirit warred. Decay against defiance. Submission versus rebellion. The future battling the past. The vast and terrible shape hove closer, taking on definition. The form of it was Protean, a huge colony creature of writhing viral clades. Given dimension and singularity, it reached out for him. A colossal, 
leprous claw with three talons spreading wide to envelop Mortarian sight. Upon the degenerated skin of it was the triad sigil, repeating over and over in fractal profusion, the same as the cluster of boils that manifested the Primarch's exposure to the Chimera virus. My champion, I will give you all you wish. A dominion of your own that can be shaped to your will. You will be what you always wanted to be. All you need do is take the mark. Take it and swear loyalty. Out past the rusting dock cradle, where Greenheart's creaking space frame lay suspended. Swear your loyalty to me. Bowed down upon one knee, Mortarin could not hold his gaze towards the black, blasted mud of Barbarus, and he looked up into the shining eyes of the newcomer. The stranger's words seemed to stop the passage of time. An aura of power, vast and barely contained, crackled about him. He looked into Mortarian's eyes and saw into the murky depths of his soul, to the lost and forgotten places within the Reaper of Men, kept hidden even from himself. Mortarian's jaw stiffened. He did not want to be an open book. He did not want to give your fealty to the Grandfather. Bowed down upon one knee, Mortarin could not hold his gaze towards the rusted, broken steel of the Terminus Est, and he looked up into the menacing eyes of the great entity that swallowed the wild sky. The god thing's utterance made the strings of reality hum and resonate. A dark ether of corruption was falling like thick sleet, thickening the space around him. The entity called itself the Grandfather filled Mortarian's lungs with the spores of living death and opened him up from within, teasing apart sealed spaces to find the rich meat of his unseen fears and his most secret hopes. Mortarian's fists clenched. He could feel his soul stripped bare. There was... You have chosen the only path you can. You have chosen the only path you can, said his father, said the Grandfather. You are my son. You are my champion. And I have waited so very long for you. And this day's dawning has been long awaited. You are my son. You are my champion. And I have waited so very long for you. And this day's dawning has been long awaited. Time and moment, past and present, the futures of them crumbled and turned into sand, smothering Mortarin in the Elves when He was there on Barbarus, and it was decades gone, and he was here in the utter insanity of the Immaterium, together and separated, divided and merging. His father, the Emperor of Mankind, his patron, the Lord of Decay Nurgle beckoned him, offering Mortarin what he could not refuse. His oath and his honor forbade him from taking any oath from this moment forward. He had sworn to bend the knee to the stranger at the lodge if he could not defeat the High Overlord, and he had a vow to protect his gene sons and his legion beyond all else. Mortarian struggled, frantically trying to grasp the truth and the lies, desperate to separate the ragged, deathly present from the echoing, ashen past. Which was his reality, or were all things true? What price is an oath given in madness? What do you want, my son? What do you want, my champion? The voices merged into a single titanic reverberation, through his bones and physical form, into the bounds of the turbulent and unique psyche. I want to endure! Then rise. Rise, Mortarian. There is a brotherhood awaiting you out in the stars, the like of which you cannot comprehend. And with it, a purpose that will illuminate the galaxy, 
a crusade upon which your name will be etched into eternity. Then rise. Rise as a prince born of death. Vengeance awaits you in the realm of men, and with it the blackest, most dire purpose. A slaughter by which your name will be feared until the last human soul fades to entropy. Mortarion said the vow without reservation then. I give myself to your banner, my blood and my bone, the unbroken force of my will and the power of my spirit. These are yours to command. If you grant me deliverance. His hand found the damaged, crackled blade of his war scythe, and he gripped it hard enough to cut metal and draw blood. By this I so swear. He looked down and saw the transformation take hold of him. A force of immeasurable mutational power crashed through his physical form and overwhelmed the pitiful limit of flesh and blood. Motarian tore away, rising to his feet, changing with each heartbeat. From his spine burst pestilent, insectile wings that quivered and crackled with new change. His soul soaked in the corrupting energy, dying and living, reborn and obliterated. The flesh across his gaunt features pulled tight, dragging his mouth into a rictus grin. The smile of death itself, he would endure. Gods, I hated cultures. I hated the heat. I hated the dust and the thick sweat of it. Even before I knew that other worlds existed, I cursed the gods for making my home so unbearable. There's a reason why religions prosper in deserts. There's nothing else to do but ponder the misery. I used to sit in the shadow of my father's house, squatting as the air shimmered. And I'd wait for scorpions to scuttle out of the glare. I'd catch them in my bare fingers and hold them up, watching them wriggle. I'd pluck their limbs off, one by one. Sometimes I'd get stung, sometimes I wouldn't. It was a kind of game, though not a very good one. Once, a sting made me feverish for a month, leaving me boiling on my mat inside with visions and shaking. I might have died. I didn't care much either way. Once I'd recovered, I was sitting right back out in the porch, waiting for the next one to scamper into range. Ever since then, I've played the same game. Get close to the danger. See how long you can last before it bites you. It doesn't matter which town that was. I can barely remember it myself. They were all the same. Thick with filth and haze and the stink of perspiration and refuse. My parents were exasperated with me. They wanted me to learn a trade, get ahead, find something useful to do. I didn't want any of that. I wanted to be rich without trying. I wanted to have slaves and concubines. I wanted to play my scorpion game with people. For a long time, it wasn't clear how I would be able to achieve that, but fate had a way of leading me into opportunity. I had noticed, uh, being an observant sort, that the Covenant had become the kind of organization that I might do well in. It is fashionable now, among those who still pretend to keep records and tell histories, to think of the Covenant as some wellspring of piety, the precursor to the fundamental religion that came later. Perhaps it was, in some places. Maybe in Varadesh they did things properly. 
Out in the provinces, though, the priests had begun to develop a reputation. They drank. They gambled. They were violent, and they used that violence to gather up riches. Even the devout knew that the tithes they paid didn't all end up embellishing temples. The whole edifice was like a spoiled aquifer, with a cold and oily heart locked away from those searching for the light of the sun. So you can understand the attraction. I could see myself in those robes, with a palace of my own, where a fountain would tinkle in the courtyard and a chamber full of young things would lounge around in silks and count my coins. There was a young man in my settlement, a, a pious one, who had inked some words of the holy books onto his face and shaven head. Every day before dawn, he would apply more henna, rewriting the sacred glyphs with only the aid of a polished silver bowl for reflection. For this, he was considered something of an inspiration in our fly-blown township. Even my own mother, fat and lazy slatter, and if ever there was one, noticed his diligence. Why can't she be more like him? She would complain, picking at her fingernails and watching me sitting idly in the porch. Why can't you be more like Erebus? Now, you see, thoughts like this have a terrible power. I took her words to heart. I pondered them. And I thought to myself, why can't I be more like Erebus? I was thinking the same thing as I garroted that young man. I might have even said the words out loud as I twisted the string and watched his eyes bulge and pop. It was the first time I killed a living soul. And God, was it sweet. My heart was pumping. My face was glowing. The more his life ebbed away, the more I felt my own burgeoning. By the time I let his body drop into the alleyway, I was positively singing inside. The sensation didn't last long. There was all the tedious business of disposing of the body, and then rooting through his belongings to get what I needed, and turning my back on my birthplace and setting out into the great dust. I couldn't stay in a place where he and I were both known. I never once regretted it. I walked out under the southern gate, with the stars rising and the heat of the day ebbing, wearing a dead man's robes, and with a dead man's script inked neatly on my own shaven head. Ah, there you go. There is the irony. The marks on my flesh. The ones that mark me out as me were never really mine. I wore them after that to ensure my stolen name and persona were never questioned. In time, I half forgot their origins. And I began to care more about what I was writing. By the time I reached for the tattooist's needle, the words had changed, and the act was more than one of disguise. Originally, though, it was all just lies. So what was my original name? Just like the name of the place where I was born, that genuinely doesn't matter. I have become like a demon, nurturing a secret moniker that only the Empyrean echoes. I certainly will not tell you. Some things even the gods don't know. Ah, there you go. There is the irony. The marks on my flesh, the ones that mark me out as me, were never really mine. Sire, if I may, interrupted Erebus. Logar granted permission with a tilt of his head. Ever the statesman, Erebus needed no time to compose himself or his answer. You embody the Emperor's hope. You are his belief in a greater way of life and his desire to raise humanity, to achieve its greatest potential. You devote yourself to these ends, forever selfless, utterly faithful, striving for the betterment of all. 
poetic, but indulgent, Oedipus. What of my failings? History will say that if the 17th Primarch had one weakness, it was his faith in others, his selfless devotion and unbreakable loyalty caused him grief beyond the capacity of a mortal heart to contain. He trusted too easily and too deeply. Erebus's solemn facade cracked. A moment of doubt flashed across his features, and he glanced at Corferon. Is that so wrong? He asked his closest advisors. Is it so wrong of me to walk the ways of a visionary, a seeker, rather than a simple soldier? What is it within my father that renders him so thirsty for blood? Why is destruction the answer to every question he is asked? Corferon clutched Lorgar's shoulder tighter. Because, my son, he is gravely flawed. He is an imperfect god. The Primarch met his foster father's eyes in the chamber's gloom, the glance sharp and cold. Do not say what you are about to say. Corferon tried, but the Primarch's glare silenced him. His eyes were sharp with a plea, not with fury. Do not say it. Do not say we tore our home world apart all those years ago in the name of false worship. I cannot live with that. It is one thing for the Emperor to spit on all we have achieved as a legion. But this, this is different. Can you piss upon the Covenant and the peaceful Colchis we created after six years of civil war? Will you name my father a false god? Speak the truth, Erebus cut in. Even if your voice shakes. Lorgar lowered his ash-streaked face into his filthy hands. In that moment, Erebus and Corferon locked eyes. The latter nodded to the former, and the first captain spoke again. You know it is true, Lorgar. I would never lie to you. This is something we must all face. We must atone for this sin. The chaplain stand with you, sire. The heart of every warrior priest in the Legion beats in rhythm with yours. We stand ready to act upon your word. Erebus added his voice to Corferon's. Lorgar shrugged off their platitudes, as well as his foster father's reassuring hand. The movement split the healing scabs on his shoulder blades, birthing trickle rivers of dark, weeping blood down his golden back. You are calling my entire life a lie. I am saying we were wrong, my son. That's all. Corferon dipped his gnarled hand into the bowl of ash by Lorgar's side. Monarchy's dust spilled through his curled fingers, stinking of charred rock and failure. We prayed to the wrong god for the right reasons, and Monarchia paid the price for our mistake. But it is never too late to atone. We purged our homeworld of the old faith, and now you fear as we all fear. Colchis prospered under the old ways and its legends, until we ravaged it in the name of a lie. This is heresy. Lorgard trembled, barely containing his emotion. It is atonement, my son. We've been wrong for so long. We must purge the root of our errors. The source lies on Colchis. Enough. The ash on Lorgar's cheeks was split by trailing tears. Both of you, leave me. Erebus rose to obey, but Corferon rests his hand on the Primarch's shoulder once more. I am disappointed in you, boy. To be so proud that you can't face up to failure and make amends. Lorgar clenched his perfect teeth, saliva glistening on his lips. You want... To return to Colchis, the cradle of our legion, and apologize for two million deaths, six years of war, and devoting an entire world to worshipping an unworthy god. 
for almost a century. Yes, because it is the mark of greatness to deal with one's mistakes. We will reforge Colchis, as well as every world we have conquered since we first left our homeworld to join the Great Crusade. And every world we take in the future must follow a new faith, rather than worship the Emperor. There is no new faith! You both preach madness! Do you think my legion kneeling in the dust shames me that Monarchia was nothing compared to the rape of my own home world over a lie? The truth cares nothing for what we wish, sire. The truth simply is. You studied the old faith. You believed it yourself as a young seeker before your visions of the Emperor's arrival. You know the way to uncover whether it was a false faith or a pure one. Lorgar wiped the drying silver tears from his face. You want us to chase a myth across the stars? His eyes flickered between them both, bright and focused. Let us speak plainly now, more than ever before. You want us to embark upon a fool's odyssey through the galaxy in search of the very gods we've spent decades denying. Logar laughed, the sound rich with disgust. I am right, aren't I? You, you want us to undertake the pilgrimage? We are nothing without faith, sir. Corferon pressed his palms together in prayer. Humanity must have faith. Nothing unites mankind the way religion inspires unity. No conflict rages as fiercely as a holy war. No warrior kills with the conviction of a crusader. Nothing in life breeds bonds and ambitions greater than the ties and dreams forged by faith. Religion brings hope, unification, law, and purpose. The foundations of civilization itself. Faith is nothing less than the pillar of a sentient species, raising it above the beast, the automaton, and the alien. Erebus drew his gladius in a smooth motion, reversing the grip and offering the sword to Lorgar. Sire, if you have truly abandoned your beliefs, then take this blade and end my life now. If you believe, there is no truth in the old ways. If you believe mankind will prosper without faith, then carve the two hearts from my chest. I have no wish to live if every principle guiding our legion lies broken at your feet. Lorgar took the blade in a trembling hand, turning it this way and that. He stared at his candle-lit reflection, a visit of gold in the silver steel. Edibus? My wisest and noblest son, my faith is wounded, but my beliefs remain. Rise from your knees, all is well. The chaplain obeyed, stoic as ever, resuming his position across from Lorgar. Then what? protects us. Why was I not devoured when you sent me that way before? You think perhaps your pretty inks, your special words, or do you think yourself favoured hand of destiny? She turned back to him, almost angry. No, none of these things, Lord Erebus. Not one will protect you. We are protected because we do the work of the gods and because of our devotion. Our ambition, our will, our determination, these things are pleasing to them. That is why you passed freely before. Will I be able to do so again? I know what you and the Golden One intend to do. I have foreseen that you will attempt to cool down the ruin storm upon the galaxy and stir the oceans of time into a tempest. This is why you are here. Not only to pass the veil that divides, you will gather your ships about you and sail unhindered whilst others founder. 
That is what you seek to learn. She sniffed and muttered to herself. Mighty sorcery indeed. Will I succeed? Her grass stalks scratched the dust, writing things only she could see. We shall see. We shall see. In the ruins of an old temple in the foothills, tended by grim-faced sentinels, Akshop began to teach him the way to open the skin of reality. Erebus's first attempts were clumsy and humiliating. He would pass Akshop's knife through the air as instructed, only rarely causing the tear he required, and then it would be too small or too short-lived. Many temple slaves were violated and sacrificed before he had mastered even the first part of the ritual. You must concentrate. Learn. Watch. She took back her knife. She muttered her words, and stood as along an angle that earthly dimensions could not describe. A crack of light split the air. With a feral smile, Akshab disappeared. Erebus noted again that she needed no sacrifice to open the way, and for a moment his resolve wavered. Patience, he told himself. She returned as she always did, bringing with her yet another entranced victim for Erebus to bleed for the glory of the gods, and then he would try again. At night, Akshab kept him awake, forcing him to meditate to clear his mind and safeguard his soul. She armoured his spirit with incantations, but the lack of sleep began to take its toll. The genetic gifts of the Legiones Astartes notwithstanding, the pile of glassy-eyed slave heads that she was making on the far side of the temple, the mark for his re-entry into the material realm, grew steadily. Then, on the 64th day, he succeeded. He made the pass with the knife, weary beyond telling. He was drained by endless repetition of the spell, annoyed to the breaking point by Akshop's insults. He felt dull inside, the words tumbling from his lips without conscious thought. Yes! Yes! The way! It is open! Now go! Go! Shield your mind! Remember all I have told you! He lifted his eyes and stepped through without hesitation. What did he feel? Tumbling. Things plucking at him. Great, unwavering power. To see into the warp with one's own mind was one thing, but to be physically in it, he could never have put it into words. Few could, for to enter that realm was death to any soul, and yet, he felt where he should exit with sense that he did not know he possessed. He tumbled to the ground only a couple of meters short from the pile of mouldering heads. Akshab sat down beside him as he lay, heaving. She looked him up and down, then stretched out her hand and closed her eyes. She spoke a spell of divination under her breath. Her mind probed at his, before her inhuman eyes snapped open again. It is you. Nothing rides your body. Erebus pulled himself from the floor, exhausted. Now rest. Akshab said with the slightest hint of pride in her voice. Tomorrow you shall do it again. His trips grew longer, first outside the ruins, then onto the plains, then later into the settlements further away. Erebus stalked the dusty streets by night. He was not out of place in the larger settlements, for the word bearers had a presence here, although when he caught sight of his legionary brothers he would duck quickly out of view. He struggled to maintain his composure. Such was his sense of triumph that he would gladly shout it to the heavens. He started to bring his own victims back to the lair. The place became fetid, buzzing with blowflies and rank with a stench of old blood. For the shorter trips, however, he no longer needed to kill. He plotted longer and longer journeys, at first only in short steps until he could circle the entire planet in one single night. Akshab's short-lived pride in her teaching grew into wariness as his competency increased. She kept her distance and became almost entirely passive. She barely spoke to him, spending long periods seemingly in a trance, but did nothing to disrupt his learning. Then he dared the moon. He stood in his daylight swamps, 
gazing up in amazement at Davin's knight's side where he had once been only seconds before. No matter how far he went, the time he felt within the warp varied little. The same sensations of power and fear, the struggle to keep his mind blank of all but his destination, the tumble from one realm to another. He lacked Akshub's elegance, but he knew he could go farther than she. He had grown more powerful than her, and they both knew it. She ceased to guide him at all. She stopped eating. Erebus guessed that she was preparing herself for the end. He was angered by that, but still she did not leave the temple. He set himself one final test. He emerged into his quarters above the destiny's hand with a clatter, spat from the warp with force. He slammed into his iron lectern, scattering books, manuscripts and data slates onto the floor. Laughing, he fell back into them. Surrounded by a jumble of arcane knowledge, he laughed long and loud. He had pinpointed a ship, moving through the warp at speed, without any beacon or homing signal. He had arrived within his locked and barred sanctum, and no one had detected him in any way. I truly am the Hand of Destiny, he murmured to himself. He left again before he was discovered back to the ruins temple on the other side of the Ultima Segmentum. Now was time for that old witch to die. Akshub was waiting for him when he arrived. She watched him as he approached. I have learned all I can from you, Priestess, Erebus said, casting off his rough robe. That is so. Only one more task remains to me here. I have foreseen it, she agreed. She did not resist as he knelt and pinned her to the floor in the center of the temple with the seven of the anathames, their unnatural blades sinking into the stone as hot knives might sink into ice. She cried out as he repeated the ritual that he had seen her perform upon the Davonite priest the day she had sent Erebus to meet the war master. She did not plead with him, not even as he peeled back her withered skin. Though she gasped as he sank the last of the blades into the exposed muscle of her chest, she was still conscious as he cut out her heart and bit into it. Her eyes fluttered as her blood ran down his chin. It is the will of the gods. Curiously, she died with a smile on her face. War Master Horus looked up from his throne, at his assembled court as Erebus entered the chamber. The Dark Apostle broke protocol, and strode forward without waiting for acknowledgement, barely even offering a dip of his head as some kind of salute. Annoyance danced in his eyes, uncharacteristically clear for once. War Master, he said with a sneer buried in the words, I bring you a gift from Cygnus Prime. A cluster of word bearers followed the chaplain into the hall, each of them holding onto a chain that extended away to a figure floating off the deck. The figure was a warrior in broken crimson armor, wreathed in a fiery red-orange glow that reeked of anger. Horus's Mournival were already stepping forward, his trusted lieutenants with their hands on boulders and blades. The issue were taken with Erebus's disrespect open for their punishment. The War Master gestured with a talon of the huge power claw in his right hand, stopping them before they could act. Instead, he rose and stepped down from the dais, ignoring Erebus. He crossed to the tormented warrior. Horus brushed aside the word bearers holding the chains, and they gingerly stepped back, releasing their charge. The demon touched legionary did not react, his inner glow seething. The War Master felt hatred radiating from the possessed body, and he turned his face to it, basking in the burn. Horus knew rage well, and he saw it contained here. The tortured, cracked armor of the warrior that had once been the son of Sanguinius wavered like a mirage. He studied the figure for anything that showed name or rank, but found only the remains of company and squad markings and the molten ruin of an apothecary's prime helix badge. Who are you? He asked, infernal eyes regarding him. Who I was no longer matters, Warmaster. 
I am a weapon at your command. Horus smiled coldly. I approve of that. The hate of a hundred thousand souls fills me. I burn eternally with it. I am bound to ruin all things. I am the fallen son of Baal, the cruer Angelus, the willing slave. I am the Red Angel. It takes Angron's title in vain. Malagurst, the War Master's Ekri dared to offer an opinion. The Gladiator will see grave offense in that. The demon bound did not look away from Horus. If the Primarch Angron wishes that name, then he may challenge me for it. I deserve it more than he ever will. A mixture of gruff amusement and irritation at his presumption moved through the assemblage of their court, and Horus let it die away, circling the possessed figure. Finally, he nodded to himself. You will be of use. He turns to walk back to his throne. Of use? Erebus repeated, and his tone halted the War Master in mid-step. This freak collision of effect is plucked from the rubble of a failed endeavor, and that is all you have to say on the matter. You take issue with this. Horus's voice was deceptively calm. It was the manner of Erebus to be meted and calculating in all things. Or at least, it had been at the beginning. But recently, the rotis that shadowed his easy cunning had waned, and there was a growth of arrogance that was becoming clear. The trap at Cygnus has failed. The blood angels should be at our banner. The dark apostle bit out the words. He jabbed a finger at the floor. Sanguinius should be kneeling before you, bathed in blood and broken. Instead, this remnant is all we have to show for our effort. So much had been put into the construction of the cults and the blood fades. We needed that legion. We would have that legion if you had not intervened. Horus showed no sign of irritation at the veiled accusation. You think I was wrong? Please, speak plainly, Erebus. I would have it no other way. That Erebus took the next step was a clear indication of how much he had changed since Davin. You broke the pattern. You disrupted the flow by offering skulls to the bloodthirster, all because you did not wish the angel to stand among us. You did not want a rival in our ranks. The blood angels walk the scarlet path, but now they will never be ours. The ruinous powers will not be pleased. The apostle's brief tirade died away into silence and no other sound rose beyond it. There came a flash of shock, quickly smothered, as too late Erebus arrived at the understanding that he had overstepped the mark. Horus studied him, examining the dense lines of text tattooed across the word bearer's face and neck. I admit, I am displeased at this turn of events. Sanguinius' death would have served many purposes, even if my vanity was one of them. He grinned, at once malicious and self-deprecating, then his manner turned cold. But so be it. The angel will face me in battle before our campaign ends. Only one of us will survive. That could have been avoided, Erebus offered, attempting to make back the ground he had given up. Do you think I am a puppet? Said Horus. He nodded at the Red Angel. A weapon to be commanded? I think you may. I think you must be reminded of your place in the scheme of things. The War Master's hand shot out and snatched at the hilt of a dagger sheathed at the Dark Apostle's belt. Erebus gave a gasp as Horus took his anatheme and turned it in his grip, letting the warp touch blade catch the chamber's ill light. You let the mask slip, Erebus. You showed yourself to me. I saw what you show them. Horus touched the tip of the dagger on the Apostle's cheek, and he flinched away as it burned him. The sons of Horus were suddenly there at his back, blocking his retreat. For a moment, 
The word bearer legionaries in the chamber hesitated, hands falling to their weapons, ready to defend their master. But Erebus slowly shook his head, warning them off. He had to realize what was to come, and that he had no choice but to accept it. Let me see that face again, said Horus, cutting a bloodied line across Erebus's forehead as his warriors took the Apostle's arms and held him rigid. Your true face. With an artist's care, the War Master sliced with the flesh and into the meat. Though he gasped and trembled, Erebus did not cry out. Horus took the severed edge between his fingers, and like the turning of a page, he skinned Erebus's face from his bloody smothered head. The word-bearer staggered back, his features a ruin of crimson, stark white eyes glaring out and unable to blink. The things that whisper in your ear, that you hold in concord with your packs and your inscriptions, remind them that they are not the architects of this war. Horus paused as he considered the bloody rag that was his new trophy. I am. They hate me, not because of what I am, but because of what they were. They hate me because they turned, and I did not. The records of our enemies call us all turncoats, but I changed no allegiance. I was always here, just as I am now aware of myself and the universe that made me. I lied with every breath I ever took, except to myself. That is purity of a kind, and something that no other soul in this grand armada of renegades can boast. I look upon terror now from my void, cold vantage, and see its huddled lights glimmer in the fragile dark. Soon, the order to attack will come, and the final act will be entered. The monsters I created will burst from their fetters, giving no thought to what long labors brought them here. Horus mutilated me. My own Primarch discarded me. That could be a cause for self-doubt, here, on the edge of Terra's fall. That could make a lesser soul slink away, gnawing on his failure, even as humanity's bastion collapses at last. But that's never been my way. I've been stung before, and I always come back for more poison. I'm still the boy in the shadows of Colchis, pulling on the grot string and feeling my blood pump. The old games never really ceased, in truth. Only the players changed. Nothing remains to be explained. I can whisper these truths to my own screed-inscribed face if I wish that I can now hold up in front of my own eyes as my only audience. The ragged flesh is dry and cracking now and will fall apart soon, but I keep it, just as I used to keep my mirrors for the same purpose. I took this face from another man once to become what I wanted to be. Now it is my reminder that all despots are fragile, and that the hand of destiny will always be despised. Such is my power. Now, I could fashion a new skin in moments. I choose not to. My face still weeps blood under my helm, glistening on flayed muscles. It hurts. And that, too, is a reminder. I was there at the start. 
I was there before we even had names for all of the things we're doing now. I have no congregation anymore, but I will again. The faithful will come back, thirsty for accounts of how this feat was achieved, and I will have stories waiting for them. Such stories. Stories that will make their ears bleed and their hearts burst. So it's not done yet, Erebus. Not yet. Just watch. Just watch. It is good to look up at the stars, said the lion, finally breaking his long silence. At times like this, a man needs to take stock of his life. I find there is no better place to take stock than beneath the stars. The lion smiled, and Zahariel found the smile dazzling. It was clear that the lion was trying to put him at ease, but Zahariel found it almost impossible to talk to him, as though he was any other man. Johnson was too big, his presence too imposing. A man could no more ignore his extraordinary nature than he could ignore the wind and the rain, or the transition from day to night. There was something similarly elemental about the lion. Lion L. Johnson was the apotheosis of all humanity's dreams for itself. He was the perfection given human form, like the first example of a new race of man. The cleansing of the forest is entering its final stage, Zahariel. Did you know that? No, my lord. I had thought the campaign was likely to continue for some time. No, not at all, said the lion, his brow furrowing slightly. Though Zahariel could not be sure if it was amusement or contemplation. According to our best estimates, there are perhaps a dozen or so great beasts left in total. Certainly no more than twenty. And they are all... In the North Wilds, we have scoured every other region of Caliban and cleared out the beasts that were hiding there. Only the North Wilds are left. But that would mean the campaign is nearly over. Nearly. At most, it should take another three months. Incidentally, you realize Amodis has asked that you be recorded in the annals of the Order as having assisted in slaying one of the last of them. A fearsome creature as well, from all accounts. Though Amodis killed it, you should be proud of your actions in the fight. You saved the lives of many of your brothers. Not all of them, said Zahariel, remembering Pallian's screams as the beast tore him apart. I... I couldn't save them all. That is something every warrior must get used to. No matter how skillfully you lead your warriors, some of them will die. It was only a matter of luck that I didn't die. The sheerest chance. A good warrior will always take advantage of chance. He should adapt to the changing circumstances of battle. War is all about opportunities, Ahariel. To be victorious, we must always be ready to take hold of our opportunities as they arise. You showed initiative in fighting that beast. More than that, you demonstrated excellence. Precisely as the verbatim defines these things and sets them out as our ultimate aim. We cannot know what mysteries the universe holds or what challenges we may face in the future. All we can do is live our lives to the fullest extent we can and cultivate the virtue of trying to achieve excellence in all things. When we go to war, it should be as master warriors. When we make peace, we should be equally adept. It is not good for human beings to accept second best. Our lives are short. We should make merit of them while we can. Abruptly coming to silence, the lion continued to stare up at the night sky as Zahariel stood beside him. I wonder what is in the stars. 
The old tales say there are thousands, perhaps millions of planets out there, just like Caliban. They say Terra is one of them. It is strange, don't you think, that every child born of Caliban knows the name Terra? We count it as the source and wellspring of our culture, but if the tales are true, it has been thousands of years since we had contact with that source. But what if the tales are false? What if Terra is a myth? A fable invented by our forefathers to account for our place in the cosmos? What if our father's tales are lies? It would be terrible, Zahariel said. He felt a shiver and told himself the night was growing colder. People take the existence of Terra for granted. If it had all turned out to be a myth, we might start to doubt everything. We would lose our moorings. We wouldn't know what to believe. True. But in other ways, it would free us. We would no longer need to be responsible to the past. The present and the future would be our only boundaries. Take the current campaign against the great beasts as an example. You are young, Zahariel. You cannot be aware of the bitter arguments, the threats and recriminations that were directed toward me when I first advanced the plans for my campaign. All too often, I found that the causes of these objections were rooted in some dated custom that had long ago worn out its welcome. Tradition is a fine ideal, but not when it serves as a shackle on our future endeavors. If it wasn't for Luther and his fine oratory, I doubt the plan would have ever been approved. It's the same with so many issues that confront us today. The diehards and the sticks in the mud oppose us at every step. Irrespective of the value of the plans I put forward, they always make reference to the past, to tradition, as though our past was so filled with shining glories that we might actually want to preserve it forever. But I'm not interested in the past, Zahariel. I think only of the future. The lion paused. Standing beside him, Zahariel wondered what Lord Cypher would make of this speech, decrying the value of tradition. Might this be another test? One designed to see whether he would simply acquiesce to what the lion was saying, or stand up for the values of tradition. As he looked upon the lion's countenance, he saw a strained intensity to the way he stared up at the sky as if he loved and hated the stars at the same time. Sometimes I wish it was in my power to wipe that past away. I wish there was no myth of terror. I wish Caliban had no past. Look at a man without a past and you see a free man. It's always easier to build when you build from scratch. Then again, I look at the stars and I think I am too hasty. I look to the stars and I wonder what is out there, how many undiscovered lands, how many new challenges, how bright and hopeful might our future be if we could make it to the stars. Such a thing seems unlikely, for the moment at least. You are right. What if the stars were to come to us? I... I don't understand. Truthfully, nor do I. But on nights when the stars are bright, I dream of a golden light, and of all the stars in the heavens coming down to Caliban and changing our world forever. The stars co come down to Caliban? Do you think it means anything? The lion shrugged. Who knows? I feel I ought to know its relevance, but every time I think I sense a connection to the golden light, it fades and leaves me alone in the dark. Then, as though shaking off the loss of such a dream, the lion said. In any case, the stars are denied to us, so we will build a future here on Caliban. Still, if we are to be limited in that way, we will not allow it to limit our vision. If we are only able to build our lives on Caliban without access to the stars, then we will make this world paradise. The lion extended an arm sweeping it in a broad gesture across the nighttime panorama of the dark forest and treetops below the walls of Alderuk. 
This will be our paradise, Zahariel. This is where we will build a bright new future. The campaign against the Great Beast is only the first step. We will create a golden age. We will make the world anew. Does that sound like a noble aim to you? It does, my lord. An aim worth committing our lives to. I raise this question here and now. Because of your youth, it is the young who will build this future, Zahariel. You have shown promise. You have the potential to be a true son of Caliban, a crusader. Not just against the beasts, but against every other evil that ails our people. Does that seem a worthy purpose? It does. The lion frowned as he stepped off, boots crunching on glass. He had hunted Quarry by touch and smell alone and had been stalked through the lightless defiles knowing the sound of a single breath would be his end. You are a less patient hunter than I. He drew the lion sword, slowly, throwing the activation rune worked into the grip as it came free, bathing twenty square meters of hangar deck in coolly energized light. The Crave host stood exposed where she had been waiting for him, on the flight deck. Her hair was the color of ominous flame, her black eyes drinking in the glow of the lion's sword. Yet for all her supernatural features, it was her posture that struck him as most uncanny, lacking the subconscious cow that betrayed even the bravest men when confronted by a primarch of the Legiones Astartes. She stood straight-backed and haughty, jaw upturned as though she looked up because she chose to rather than because the one and a half meter difference in height between them meant that she had to. Did you believe you could hide? I am the Angel of Darkness. Lionel Johnson. She said in a voice like grinding glass. You grace me with your presence at last. The lion dipped his head. The Imperium would never acknowledge this foe, or know the cause of their annihilation from history and so it was only just that the lion salute a worthy adversary before the end. Savine. The woman bared black-veined teeth. You know her name? Did she imagine that I did not? Is that the petty resentment that weakened her mind to you? No one is admitted aboard my ship without my approval. Nothing transpires here without my knowledge. I keep no secrets that cannot suffer scrutiny. Malkador knows this as well as I. I requested Savine. The Crave host swayed as though struck. Savine has suffered for her shortcomings. As soon will you. I have already slain one of your kind. Your arrogance in facing me is deeply misjudged. He was young. Barely six times older than your race. You speak to me of arrogance while failing to recognize the strength in front of you. Tell me your true name, Xenos. I alone will recognize it after your demise. It is beyond your ability to pronounce or comprehend. Savine will suffice. She would have enjoyed this moment if she were still here. The lion looked up. The crave host hovered a meter above him. She dropped with a laugh, sinking her claws into his scalp. The docking bay disappeared. It was still there, after a fashion. A reflection glimpsed through the smoke, vanishing with every shift of the wind. The fire gutted to embers, the shadows stretching up like tall trees, like bars. The hard bangs of Tregane's bolt were echoes through the vastness of a forest at dawn. This is Caliban. This is your mind, said Savine. She looked around, feigning interest of the remembrances whose skin she wore. In this place of the mind, her appearance was almost human. Dark veins withdrawn, 
pupils shrunken, only a faint luminosity of the skin that was in tune with the unreality of her surroundings. What a drab and flavorless place it is, too. A mind like this has no right to exist. You, your brothers, your sons, you sicken me. The lion struck with his sword, only to find his hand empty. Fingers uncurled from their grip as Savine laughed. All your prowess, all your gene-wrought strength, it is worth nothing here. In here, I am... The words became an airless choke as the lion lifted her by the throat. Her eyes bulged, her feet kicking futilely as she scratched at his forearms. The leaves of the shadow forest rustling and wavering as she did so but no relief or rescue broke through. The reality that the Primarch had constructed. The lion was the master of all his domains. You dived willingly into a Primarch's mind, and for that hubris alone, you deserve this failure. He squeezed tighter. The hands around her throat were metaphorical. The assault mental. The psychological equivalent of a covering of a candle with a jar. Only his flame fed off the energies of the ether rather than air. The air was thick with smoke, tainted with the harsh odors of burnt metal and solder. Hundreds of fires of various sizes, and severity burned over the familiar. It grievously mourned the topography of the docking bay. The lion shifted position his body telling him he had been immobile for longer than his recollection of the events could account for. And Zavine's body limply fell from his shoulder. She landed with the grace of a corpse. Tregain approached, and he looked at Savine. Then he looked up at his Primarch. The lion gave a nod. She is dead. May I be the first to congratulate you on your recent victory? Once again, the Emperor received the lion within the staterooms aboard his flagship. The glorious suit of golden chambers elevated his imperial majesties to the point of inconsequentiality. So rich were they, so sumptuously appointed that, like the Emperor himself, it was difficult to form a distinct impression beyond a sense of humbling and of awe. Once again, the lion recalled little of the antechamber and the grand processionals, that had preceded his passage. It was as if part of him had always been here, in these rooms with his father, and that part could never leave. Thank you, father. You were not the first of my sons to reclaim a place at my side, but your tally of victories is second to no other. Even Horus looks upon them with envy. Horus inspires, Magnus enlightens, Logar illuminates, Rabute raises an Imperium in miniature that celebrates his name and yours. I have left as many worlds behind me as any two of my brothers, but I fear that darkness and ash be the legacy I leave to your Imperium. The Emperor considered long, as he did often, before giving an answer. In the time of the Egypta, there was an empress named Hatshepsut. By all accounts of her that survived, she was an equitable and proficient ruler. By the standards of her time, she rebuilt her land in the wake of war and occupation, erecting great monuments and bringing prosperity to her people. She reassembled the Egyptus navy, using it to reestablish their old empire and launched military campaigns against the nations who had once been their oppressors. A legacy whose parallels are not hard to see. And yet, those who came after her did all within their power to ensure that she would have no legacy. Her name was chiseled from every monument, her every deed and triumph stricken from public record. Even her body was removed from its royal tomb. Why, if her reign was so equitable? Because those who succeeded her desired it. Because sometimes what comes before is too troublesome to be paved over in Rockcrete to a man with a monument to compliance or a golden aquila on an imperial flag. 
Sometimes it is enough only that it be destroyed, that no trace of it but darkness and ash be left to endure. And yet history still remembers this Empress. The Emperor Tutmos III did not have his dark angels. It is a pity that your campaigns kept you from the triumph. Your presence was missed by your brothers. Horus, in particular, spoke to me of his regret. He knows that I would have attended had I been able. The lion replied, a tone far sharper than any he had before employed in the presence of his father. You are troubled. The Imperium celebrates, but its triumph is empty. The galaxy is not won because Horus has his great victory. Recall my words to you. Ulanor is just another victory. Then why the pageantry? Some men demand such pomp. They cannot accept the end of one era and the commencement of another without an occasion by which to mark it and give it meaning. Laurels must be given, honors and fair titles invented so that they may be bestowed upon favored generals. Some men need recognition. The shadows around the Emperor's throne deepened, but beneath the layers of offutation, deep within the myriad guises of that singularly unfathomable being, the lion felt the Emperor behold his firstborn son. Some men do not. My brother, hissed Conrad Kurz, Lord of the Eighth Legion. His was a viper's smile, just as predatory, just as brazen in its hunger. I have missed you. The lion hesitated. He raised his hands to his collar, unlocking the helm seals hidden there, and pulled the helmet free. An expression of naked surprise marked his features, yet his face was still an angel's countenance. Not the beific, handsome lies of ancient religious myth, but rather the truth of Terran artistry. A face that could have been shaped from tanned marble, emerald eyes with soulful depths, contrasted by a mouth that would forever struggle to show emotion. To Corswain's eyes, Curse was pathetic, ghoulish in comparison, a wretched husk facing a knight lord, claws against a prince's sword. Curse? The lion asked, his resonant voice softened by disbelief. What has happened to you? The Night Lord ignored the question, speaking with insincerity rich enough to make Corswain's teeth ache. Thank you for coming. How it warms my heart to see you. The lion drew his blade in a slow, clean movement. He neither brought it on guard, nor threatened the other Primarch. Instead, he clutched it in both black gauntlets, the cross piece hilt before his face as he stared at Kurz above the quillions. I will ask you this once, and once only. Why did you betray our father? I would ask you something in return, brother. Kurz answered with a grin, his filed teeth on display. The clawed Primarch's eyes were an unhealthy bright rich with a secret sickness. Why did you not? The lion lowered his blade to end the salute, knightly respects now paid. Our father has charged me to take your head back to Terra. Our father said nothing, for he hides within his dungeons, collecting the secrets of the universe and sharing them with no one. Lorgar and Magnus have seen everything our father sought to hide, so do not carry a precious little lie as your shield, lion. You are Dawn's hound, running here to the eastern fringe because he ordered you. Kurz licked his filed teeth. Come, brother. Let us at least do one another the service of being honest. I know Dawn. Here, the Night Lord gave his cadaverous smile again. He sent you to do that which he feared to try himself. I did not come to duel with words, Conrad. I came to end this crusade. The Night Lord shook his head, 
his pallid face grey in the weak moonlight. His lips were only the colour of his visage, and even they were a bloodless bloom. Speak with me, brother. Listen. Reply in kind, and then decide if we must continue this war. You will not sway me with your traitor's tongue. Kurz nodded, utterly unsurprised. His vile facade cracked for a moment, revealing the warrior he'd once been, perhaps never pure, never free of torment, but capable of emotion beyond the condescending bitterness. The strained lines of pain faded from his brow, and the serpent's sneer left his lips. His voice was still raw, still ruined, but now carried an edge of sorrow. I know. So what harm is there in speaking together this one last time? The lion nodded. Wait here. He ordered his sons. I will return soon. The warriors fell silent as their lords returned, still distant, but close enough to be heard. The lion acknowledged his warriors with a curt nod. They responded with salutes, forming the sign of the Aquila over their tabards. Kurz ignored his sons, still addressing his brother. Horus himself charged me to speak those words to you. He said that the Night Lord had seen cadaverous before. Now he was practically exhumed. The Primarch's eyes, with what little white actually showed around the pupils, were inhumanely bloodshot. His gaunt features were dusted with a faint sheen of cold sweat, and a trickle of dark blood ran from his nose. He wiped it away in the back of his gauntlet. Savage weapons, one and all, too dangerous to be wielded without cost. That is all history will see of us. Even you, lion. Even you. The lion shook his crowned head. You underestimate our father's empire. And you overestimate humanity. Look at us. See how we've jeweled for the last two years out here in the void. A crusade between two legions and countless worlds that is still only just beginning. You have chased me for two years across a hundred battlefields. And why do we meet now? Because I allow it. The lion conceded to that with a slight nod. You hide like vermin fleeing the coming of dawn. Curse shrugged, the barest rise of one shoulder guard. You will never reach terror in time to defend it, brother. The warp will not let you. The crusade will not let you. I will not let you. Do you think the archives of future generations will look upon you kindly for your absence? Kurz paused in his diatribe, wiping away a fresh trickle of blood. Or will the human descendants of this Imperium look to your legend and whisper of doubt? Will they ask why you were not present to defend the throne world and speak likely lies that perhaps the lion was not as loyal and true as the mighty, perfect, rogal dawn? Perhaps the lion and his dark angels waited in the deepest reaches of space, watching, listening, and deciding to join the fight only when an obvious victor emerged. The Night Lord's eyes glinted again, with both amusement and sorrow. That is your fate, Lion. That is your future. Forgive me, brother. Kurz tilted his head. For what? Corswain was watching both Primarchs, yet still he never saw what happened. Such was the speed of the Lion's movement. One moment the two brothers were speaking. The lion's features cast down in contemplation. Curse's eyes fever bright as he promised an ignoble fate. The next, Curse's features twist into a taut, rictus of pain, blood rushing between his clenched teeth. The lion held tight to the grip of his blade, buried to the hilt in his brother's stomach. More than a meter of shining, blood-stained steel thrust through the back of Curse's armor. For such a dishonorable blow. The lion whispered into Kurz's pale, bleeding face. I do not care who knows.
knows the truth now, tomorrow, or in 10,000 years, loyalty is its own reward. The lion pulled his sword free, and the Night Lord fell back. The Primarchs doomed, healers of their sons hurt. We never sparred, did we? The lion sounded almost bored, his words still carrying over the Vox. Every few seconds they would see a new cut ripped open in Kurz's armor, or slashed across his face. He was fast enough to avoid death at the lion's hands, but not skillful enough to flawlessly defend against every attack. I never cared for swords. Kurz weaved under the carving blade, thrusting out with both claws. The lion tilted back, his balance executed to preternatural perfection. Kurz's claws shredded the ivory tabard, barely scratching the layered ceramite beneath. There exists nothing of elegance inside you. The lion turned the blade in his hand, parrying another dual claw strike with a single blade. And nothing of loyalty. For a time, I considered you my truest brother. No others grew untouched by civilization, only you and I. Kurz licked his sharpened teeth, eyes narrowed with effort. You should be with us, brother. Even your own legion senses it. The first legion strife is not unknown to the War Master. There is no strife! Their blades locked in that moment, Kurz catching the lion sword in the net of his linked claws. No. The Night Lord spat the word as a curse. No risk of the fair angels falling. When did you last walk upon the soil of Caliban, O oh proud one? The lion smiled. For the first time Kurt had ever seen it. But the movement of his brother's lips still did nothing to warm his statuesque visage. Stone gave off more warmth than that smirk. He gave no answer beyond the smile. Kurz returned it, just as insincere, just as lifeless in that moment. He stopped fighting, ceased his measured dueling, and leapt at his brother with a howl. With the warring Primarchs that presented the pinnacle of human possibility in warfare, now the lion's poise, skill and grace counted for nothing. They bawled as brothers, rolling across the ground, hands at each other's throats. When the tumbling ended, Kurz knelt atop the lion, pinkish saliva sprayed from his pale lips as he bore down on his brother. Claws gasped to strangle, to inflict that most slow and intimate of murders, when Slayer and Slain stare into each other's eyes. Die! Kurz breathed. Desperation ruined his voice, rasping it from bleeding lips. You should never have survived that tainted world you call home. The lion's armored hands grasped his brother's throat in mirror response, but the Night Lord's advantage was crystal clear. Kerr shook the lion's neck in his fists, cracking his brother's head against the rocky ground again and again and again. Die now, brother. History will be kinder to you this way. You mistrust me and my motives. You have told me so, clearly. You suspect me of a treason at least as great as Horace's, if not deeper. Imperium Secundus, you do not deny it. You are establishing a second Imperium on the corpse of the first. No. 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 I am trying to keep the flame alive. This is not about empire building or thrusting for the main prize. I have an empire already. Ultramar, 500 worlds. Brother, I do this only so that we may persist. Terror may have fallen, and our father may already be dead. Whatever the facts, the ruin storm prevents us from knowing the truth. I am not taking this moment to move to my advantage. And I'm not using the crisis as an opportunity to usurp. I am not Lupercal. I am simply keeping the flame alive. If we need another capital world, another figurehead, then let us have one. If it keeps our father's vision of the Imperium alive. If terror burns, then McCrag lives. 
the Imperium endures. Do you know the real difference between me and Horace Lupercal, brother? Tell me. I don't want to be Emperor. Help me do this, brother. Help me keep what is left together. Help me preserve the human intent. Don't make argument with me and misinterpret my motives. I want to trust you, Rabute, but I have always been wary of your ambition. Your Imperium, then, this Imperium Secundus, this great scheme of survival. How do you intend to proceed? Do you intend to declare yourself regent? I do not. I will not found an empire and then crown myself. Such arrogance would confirm every doubt and suspicion lurking in the minds of men like you. I need a figurehead for the public to rally around while I fight to keep the mechanisms of the Imperium turning over and protected. But who then? Surely it must be blood. Agreed. It must be a Primarch. My dear Rabute, there are only two of us here. I am the Lord Protector. It is my duty to ensure our defense from any threat. Be it from outside or within, there is no greater threat than Kurs, a canker right here on McCrag. Perhaps even still within the Civitas, regardless of our brother's assertions. Toys with us, distracts us, perverts us from the goals we seek. While he is here, nothing is safe. Imperium Secundus cannot grow. What are you asking for? I ask for nothing. The lion glanced over his shoulder in irritation and returned his gaze to the Emperor. You have given me what I need already. You appointed me as Lord Protector and oaths were sworn. It is upon my honor to uphold the responsibilities placed upon me. And it is upon yours to let me do so. There can only be one Emperor. The Lion whirled about, stopping himself an instant from striking the Primarch of the Ultramarines. Gilliman stepped back, startled. And I will protect him! The Primarch of the Dark Angels roared. He threw out an imploring hand to Sanguinius. Brother, stand by your oaths. Free my hand from the bondage of personal niceties. You entrusted your life to me. Now it is time to prove that trust. What would you do? Ah, Sanguinius. He looked at Gilliman for a second, and then back at the lion. What has our brother not done that you will? Crag has been a fortress from without, but it must be fortified from within. Martial law, a total suspension of contact with any ships that have not been thoroughly inspected. Quarantine, if you will, curfew, searches, surveillance and investigation without limit. There will be no shadows to hide Kurz, no cracks for him to move along, no gaps to fall through. Nothing will pass upon the face of McCrag without my knowledge. The lion slowly closed his fist, as if he held the world in his hand. It is what our brother has done that I will not that is more the matter. And what is that? Shown restraint. It was several seconds of silence before Gilliman spoke moving past the lion to stand next to Sanguinius. The decision is yours, my lord. I would not allow this. It moves against everything we have sought to build. The new Imperium will never be broken from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Sanguinius nodded, and the lion took in a sharp breath. He was ready to make further argument for his case, but the Blood Angel met his gaze and silenced him with a look. What you say is true, Robute, but only to a point. Our brother is right. We must each be a pillar of the new Imperium, and if we remove one support, the whole edifice will crumble. Kurz will not stop unless we stop him. With the beacon of Sotha reduced to a fraction of its power, the Imperium will need strength and guidance more than ever. And that is your task, 
Though we have defeated many foes of late, the war is not over. There are many battles to be waged. It is for this reason we swore to uphold the commands of our brother from Caliban. If he is not worthy of such a duty, then you cannot be the statesman of the Imperium, and I cannot be its Emperor. Gilliman signaled his capitulation with a resigned look and a nod of the head. The Lion looked at Sanguinius and could only guess at the new Emperor's thoughts. Was he simply acting as a peacemaker, maintaining the illusion of hope until his foreseen demise? Or did he truly believe in Imperium Secundus and the part it would play in guiding the future of mankind? Did it matter? Not to the Lion. He knew what needed to be done. It had been his weakness, his hesitation on Sogwalsa, that had allowed Kurz to escape. This time he would leave nothing to chance. Before the winter finished, Kurz would be dead by his hands. It was a pleasing thought, and he suppressed a smile as he bowed to Sanguinius. I will be done, my Emperor. You have doubts, brother. The lion stated it without question, and knew Gilliman was required to answer as the two of them paced along a long balcony on the southern aspect of the fortress of Hera. Thirty meters below them, a company of Praesatal Guard marched towards the port Hera, their footfalls in unison. It was almost dusk, the day spent in long discussion about the Imperium. Sotha, in the preparation for the declaration of Legatus Militant, that would suspend the civil authorities of Macrag and hand executive power to the Imperial Triumvirate. No, I have fears, brother. Grave fears. The lion stopped and looked south across Macrag Civitas. The city was sparkling with thousands of lights as twilight encroached, and beyond he could see the blue plumes of plasma jets rising from the landing fields. He could smell salt amongst the fumes of traffic and people as the wind shifted to come in from the sea. His silence invited Gilliman to continue. Every action begets a reaction. Have you considered that Kurz wants us to assume absolute authority? He wages a different war from us, for objectives we cannot guess at. He is insane, lashing out blindly at any target. A wounded, maddened animal trying to protect itself. You heard Lord Sanguinius's account as well as I did, brother. Kurz's madness has an end game. He seeks justification, affirmation, retaliation. You are giving him that. The lion thought about this, knowing that he owed his brother the courtesy of proper consideration. The alternative is to let him wreak havoc across Macrag, across the Imperium. Our new emperor said it, he must be stopped. That is not what he said. Gilliman argued. The other Primarch sighed and turned away, leaning his back against the pale stone of the Bastulate. The practical application of more security brings about consequences that theory cannot predict. Such as? We are asking my Legion to stand against their own. This is Macrag, the world of the Ultramarine. Many of my warriors have connections here, family ties. We were never meant to rule directly. You must understand the potential conflict this generates. Unforeseen consequences are just that, brother. What ruin will Kurz bring about if we do not curtail him now? I cannot conceive of such a future. The best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time. Tomorrow will bring protest. How will we deal with that? You will deal with it, brother. As Lord Warden, it remains your duty. I will be busy commanding my legion. You cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. I evade nothing. The lion looked at Gilliman and could not guess what his thoughts were. It was a hard task the Ultramarine's Primarch had taken upon himself. The Dark Angel sought to alleviate some of that burden, allowing his brother the time and space to perfect the design of his creation. And you need not concern yourself with conflicts of interest. My warriors will show no fear or favor in the application of their duties. Your legion's hands are clean. You cannot mean 
Gilliman stared, looking in shock at the lion. You, you cannot bring your legion to Macrag. I have already issued orders, brother. You have admitted that your warriors cannot be trusted to guard their own. You think you can usurp me on my own world? Gilliman was almost hoarse, throat tightened by his distraught state. Our world, the cradle of the new Imperium. Caliban lies beyond the ruin storm, far from my reach. Half my legion I left under the command of Corswin. I have given up my home, my warriors, to join this endeavor. What are you willing to sacrifice? Horus had tried to take the Imperium for himself, and Gilliman had decided to build a new one, as much as he did not want to belittle his brother. The Primarch of the Dark Angels knew that there could only be one winner in the war to come. There would be no second place. Kurs had to be dealt with at any cost. Any cost. Even Gilliman's pride. The lion stepped close, his voice dropping. Do you trust me, brother? I am not Horus. No, you are not. And you are not what he has become. But remember, brother, remember what he was. I remember. I remember how wise I thought our father was to make him war master. I remember Horus's doubts, how he wondered if he was worthy of the task. How could this brother turn on us? Remember that none of us saw his treachery coming. Our father didn't see it coming. Remember all of this, and remember that here is where Horus fell. Now tell me, you are certain there is nothing below? He's right. I would like to know what happened to Horus. You think I don't? And if Sanguinius is correct, what then? Is our strategy to replicate Horus's error? Gilliman turned back to Sanguinius, an eyebrow raised. Where do you stand, Robute? I wanted to hear you both out. We have a lot of data, but it does not point in a clear direction. We have just come through unambiguous evidence of the importance of Davin. But the Necrosphere tells us nothing about how we should deal with the problem this world presents. He drummed his fingers on the table. On balance, I agree with the Lion. Our enemy isn't here. It is somewhere in the Necrosphere. You saw it, Sanguinius. You've done battle with it already. We can't fight it until it declares itself. I agree. Destroying Davin may bring it out. In any event, I think a landing here will be a distraction. It will not be. We have to know what is down there. We have to go. He stared at the center of the map. No, they could not understand. There was someone who would, though. I must speak with Conrad. The lion snorted in surprise. You think he will convince me? No. Nevertheless, I would speak with him. As Sanguinius reached the stratagem's door, the lion said, I will take action without delay. You will be wrong to do so. Sanguinius said and left. The klaxons boomed through the corridors. The invincible reason was maneuvering into position for the bombardment. I have no authority over you. Nevertheless, I am giving this command. I will not be opposed in this. Sanguinius placed his hand on the hilt of the blade in Carmine. He did not draw it. The act was less a threat than a reminder. He had no intention of harming the legionaries. Physically opposing him, though, was more than they could do. He spread his wings, lifting them high. He filled the corridor and towered over the Dark Angels. Do what your honor demands. Know that the responsibility for what happens now is mine, not yours. These events are beyond your ability to control. The legionaries did not move, but they did not raise their guns. Know this too. What I do, I do for the Imperium. So does the Lion. Nothing that happens now changes this fact. Sangonius drew the blade in Carmine and smashed the blade against the helm of one guard, spitting it open and staggering the Dark Angel. He whirled and seized the other guard before he could fire. He raised the Dark Angel and slammed him against the wall. 
his breath hissing with anger at the necessity of what he did. He struck both guards with the flat of his blade, hammering them into unconsciousness. Forgive me. He turned from them to a small chamber a few paces further up the hall. It was the guard post. He entered it, yanked open a plasteel vault, and took the chains and neuro manacles he found inside. He returned to Kurz and worked in silence, as he transferred the Night Haunter from the wall shackles to the new restraints. The beats of the klaxons continued, counting away the time before Davin's annihilation. No threats. No warnings that I will die if I try to escape. Escape to where, Conrad? Well said. There is no escape for any of us, is there? He took Kurz down from the wall. He shackled the Night Haunter's hands behind his back, but left his legs free. Kurz cocked his head at the sound of the klaxons. I hear the blaring of your time running out. There is time enough. Kurz laughed as they ran past the fallen guards. You do your very best to bring me joy, brother. Sanguinius, the lion shouted through the angel's vox bead. What are you doing? What I must, as you are. But you are wrong. You are setting us against each other. This is madness. No, it is necessary. And it is fated. He shut down the channel, cutting the line off mid-roar. Sanguinius opened a vox channel to his chapter masters. Launch drop pods. Immediate landing in the vicinity of the temple. All forces away now. The lion gripped the arms of his throne. He took a breath, forcing himself to see clearly through the red haze of anger. Ospex, give me a trajectory. What are your orders? Stenius asked. Do we shoot my brother down, you mean? The lion thought. Wood creaked beneath his grip. Damn you, Sanguinius. Damn you for forcing that choice on me. Drag it all the way down. He knew where the angel was heading. He gave the command solely because one was needed. Why did he take Kurz? What sense does that make? He acts according to his convictions. He is wrong. We must act for the Imperium. The fleet is in position. Bombardment targets locked. So noted, Captain. Then Gilliman was voxing. You can't fire now. The lion killed the vox. My lord. I will have silence. The lion told him. The noise of the bridge fell to a murmur. Davin filled the oculus. Its atmosphere streaked by the fires of the drop pod descents. The decision loomed before the lion. He had to make it now. The madness of Sanguinius' actions convinced him even more firmly of the need to destroy Davin. The world was dangerous. It was attacking them even now, even though all the scans still showed no activity of any kind. Perhaps his existence was enough. It was a foul thing, and had to be purged from the galaxy. If this is what I must do then, destroy it and kill Sanguinius, precipitate war with the Ninth Legion, and possibly the Ultramarines as well, that would serve Horus well. And what is the alternative? Stay in my hand and let this madness play out, allow Davin to wreak havoc, reach this point only to fall into a trap. The destruction of Davin was an absolute imperative. If he had any doubts left after Epimos, they would have been burned away by Sanguinius' actions. The corrupted worlds must die, and Davin was the source of the corruption. Give the order, said the inner voice of brutal necessity. You know what must be done. The lion nodded to himself. Captain, prepare to- He stopped. His blood froze at the enormity of what he was about to say. Cancel the bombardment. Prepare for a mass landing. We are taking Davin. The lion stormed from the bridge. He marched through the corridors, his fury warning all, legionary and mortal from his path. He did not stop until he reached Kurz's cell. He dismissed the guards. He had no good reason for having come here. He hadn't consciously known where he was heading at first. He stood in the cell and faced the wall, staring at the empty manacles. He blinked and held up his right hand. There was a faint tremor in his fingers. So close. He whispered. He had come within a word of murdering his brother. A word. A malign influence has been working on me. 
an influence too subtle for him to feel its effects and resist them. Slowly and patiently, it had been leading him to ruin. The lion closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them, the cell seemed too welcoming, as if he had come here to condemn himself. He grunted and stepped into the corridor. He slammed the door closed behind him. He felt no freer. There were chains around him, all the stronger because he was not sure of their nature. He voxed Gilliman. Rubute, you must beware. What have you done? You can't bombard! I am not. The lion interrupted. But I almost did. Gilliman fell silent, absorbing the implications. Rubute, beware of yourself. Do not trust your impulses. Be sure of your decisions. I almost destroyed us. I failed my father. The lion says, the words coming unbidden to his lips. I fear I also failed my brothers. I do not wish to fail my sons. Your sentiment is somewhat late. The rearmost warrior says caustically. The lion looks over the marks on his armor, placing him. Knight Sergeant Afgar, it is good to see you again. I cannot say the same. Afgar replies. His finger is not far from his bolt gun's trigger. The lion suddenly wonders how wise this meeting was. He is unarmored, and even a Primarch has reason to fear, a point-blank blast from a plasma gun. I presume Zavriel explained that I place no onus on you to come here. I was deceived by Horus for years, while he pretended to be loyal to the Emperor. I was deceived by my brothers, and I was deceived by the powers they served. When I returned to Caliban, it seems that many of us were deceived again. I witnessed Luther wield foul sorcery of the kind I had only seen used by the traitors. But I now believe that many of my sons who were on that planet with him had been deceived as well, and knew nothing of his fall. I am trying to see past deception to the truth and leave recrimination aside. It is very convenient that you should come to this conclusion now you have returned to an Imperium in ruins and seek to rebuild it once more. Afkar says sarcastically. He removes his helmet and his dark, distrustful eyes lock onto the lion's own. Where was the benefit of the doubt when you had most of a legion at your back? I learned to survive on Caliban by acting with certainty. And that was a mindset I took with me into the galaxy. It evidently was not foolproof. Perhaps burned as I was by betrayal and grief, I reacted too swiftly and with too much choler. However, Caliban fired on its own brothers without warning. If you truly believe the fault was mine alone, why are you here? Can this truly be our Primark? The swordsman interjects, waving the hand that does not rest on the pommel of his blade. His height is right, Zabriel, but his visage is much changed, and he is less vengeful than I expected. The lion's temper flares, had been spoken of in such a casual manner, but he keeps a firm grip on it. Knight Commander Kai, I see your humors are unchanged. Thank you, Kai says, stretching a slight bow. That was not necessarily a compliment. That depends on how accurate one's opinion of me is. Kai draws his power blade. I see you came armed, my Lord Lion. I wonder whether your skills have decayed as much as your face has aged. If he wishes us to follow him, then I wish to test him in the only way that matters. After all, I was always best with a blade in the Legion. Causewain might have given me some trouble, but uh, only on his better days. And besides, he is not here. He activates his blade. There is no further warning, no salute with his weapon or statement of intent. He simply attacks. The lion steps back from the first thrust and draws fealty on pure instinct. The power field crackling into life, just in time to deflect Kai's second swing. The former knight commander is pressing forward aggressively with speed, switching between single and double-handed grips from moment to moment. His every movement and attack. 
However boastful Kai's claim about his preeminence within the Legion may be, they are not entirely without merit. He is undoubtedly an expert swordsman. The Lion has waded through a host of foes with nothing more than his armoured hands, and slain members of the Traitor Legions and their younger kin on Kamarth, with fealty without pause. But none of those foes possess Kai's ability. The Lion circles to his right, but Kai's footwork is excellent, and his attacks do not relent. The Lion slaps the point of his opponent's blade aside just before it grazes his chest. Kai has come close to landing a blow three times, despite his reach disadvantage, and this is because he's leaving himself open. The Lion jugs his blade back from the instinctive thrust that would take Kai in the side. The unnatural movement spoils his balance for a moment. Kai seizes on the opportunity and presses hard, fainting for a strike at the Lion's face and then changing it to a chopping blow, which nearly leaves the Primarch's right arm truncated below the elbow and fealty lying in the grass. Do you want me to kill you? I am attacking you! Why would you not? The lion makes a grab for Kai with his free hand and nearly loses it. Will you fight me? Kai roars, swinging for the lion's head. Where is the emperor's foremost warrior? The lion leans backward to avoid the blows, knocks aside the next thrust that comes for his belly and lashes out with a kick. His bare foot connects flush on Kai's chestplate and knocks the former knight commander backwards through the air for some ten feet. Kai lands in the grass with a thud, but he is back on his feet within a moment, his sword still in hand. Now, however, the lion is moving into the attack. He does not aim for Kai's body or head, for he suspects that his son will not be guarding himself. Instead, his next strike is for Kai's weapon. The power blade is knocked to one side. Kai manages to hold on to his sword, but the next blow knocks it from his hand completely, and the lion brings fealty to point up rest a finger's breadth from Kai's gorget. Do not test me again! The lion growls. Kai kneels and removes his helm, but the face so revealed is smiling. Forgive me, lord. Words of reconciliation are easy to utter, but little reveals the spirit like swordplay. You could have killed me, but did not. If your intentions are to safeguard this world and others, then I pledge my blade to you once again. What if I had killed you? Then my companions would have known that your words were empty. Kai says. The lion snorts. He remembers Knight Commander Kai as a braggart, about whom it was whispered more than once that he might belong in the Emperor's children but also as a warrior who would never ask anything of others that he was not willing to attempt himself. The first legion as it was will never exist again. Adaptation is critical. I will not rule. I have no wish to. I will command those who are willing to be commanded, and I will lead those who will follow. I know Kai, and he has said his piece. Lohawk has also given me his answer, and with your recommendations, I will accept him. What of you, Afka? Afka's jaw works for a moment, but he finally maglabs his bolter to his thigh and straightens. You will give the same opportunity to any of our brothers whom we might encounter. If they are corrupted, I will not stay my hand. But I will not make the same mistake I did on Caliban and assume corruption without proof. We are all out of step with the Imperium. Determining the exact nature of those differences and the reconciliation of them is for a time when humanity is not threatened by extinction. He raises his eyebrow. Afgar? Afgar still hesitates, but when he does move, he moves swiftly. He drops to one knee quicker than either of his brothers, as though finally succumbing to a heavy weight or as though perhaps a long-held tension has finally been released. If you are not who we thought you were, then we were fools. Fools who fired on their own battle brothers for no reason! Say not for no reason, the lion says. He tries to keep his tone neutral, for condescension could be as counterproductive as his anger. Say that you were deceived, as was I, and that you now have the opportunity to atone whatever mistakes you feel you made beside me, instead of from the shadows. Afkar nods, 
I will not spurn this opportunity. The lion takes a deep breath of the night's air, savoring the smell of the plants. They are a welcome reminder of the forest of his home, without any of the threat. Come with me, my sons. We have a campaign to plan. And do my brothers not suffer in similar adverse conditions? Or are they somehow able to overcome such deliberations? Ferris pressed. I do not know, my lord. The Primarch grunted and addressed Santar. Do you concur with your fellow captain? I am as frustrated as you, my Primarch. Ferris's eyes narrowed to silver slits before he turned his back to regard a broad stratagem table that had manifested in the wake of the hololith. I doubt that. He muttered. He passed a shimmering silver hand across the geographical representation of the desert continent to magnify the view projected across the glass slate. Several potential node locations were identified by flashing beacons as well as two further markings. A red and green dotted line. But it fails to answer why we are so far behind, said Ferris glaring at the red line, as if doing so would will it further across the map. Unsurprisingly, it did not. My lord, if I may. Desan began, and Santar groaned inwardly, for he knew the mistake his fellow captain had made, even before he'd made it. Perhaps there is more slow in our efforts than merely sun and sand. Speak plainly, brother captain. Sorcery, my lord. I can put it no plainer than that. Our efforts are thwarted by Eldar witches. Is that your best excuse for failure? His silvered fist clenched at the edge of the stratagem table, birthing a web of cracks that would have riven the landscape with the catastrophic earthquakes had they been real. Desan felt the imagined tectonic ruptures all the way up his spine. It would explain why our efforts have thus far- Ferris Manus's fist slammed against the map, arresting the floundering captain's words. The resulting split almost broke it in two. I am not interested, he said, and it was as if the air in the stark chamber grew colder, cold enough to burn. The Primarch folded his arms. Fathomless silver pooled across his immense biceps, shimmering and refugent. Desan, who had seldom been this close to his lord for so long, found his sight drawn to them. Do you know how I came by this magnificent aberration? Asked Ferris, noting the captain's interest. Desan hid his confusion at the line of questioning well. Like most exceptional beings, Primarchs were occasionally inscrutable. Have you heard of my deeds? Of how I bested a storm giant in a feat of strength? Or how I scaled Karashi, the ice pinnacle, with my bare hands? Or perhaps you are familiar with the day when I swam deeper than the horn behemoth of the Super Huron Sea? Do you know these stories? Desan's reply was not much louder than a whisper. I have heard the great sagas, sire. Ferris wagged a finger lost in monologue and nodding sagely as if he'd just come upon the answer to his own conundrum. No, it was a Sirna. He was called Silver Wind and the greatest of the ancient drakes. No blade could pierce his metal skin. No spear or lance that I possessed. He paused, as if reminiscing. I burned it. Held its writhing body beneath the lava lows of Medusa until it was dead. And when I withdrew my hands, they were... He held out both his arms. Like this. And so the saga speakers would say... Uh, my lord. Santar wanted to intervene, but a lesson was being imparted. The tale was simply that. A story crafted by bards and the tribal orators of the clans, as related in the canticles of travels. It was told differently every time the first captain had heard it. 
No iron hand could claim its veracity, for none had been present during the lightless days of the Primarch's arrival on Medusa. Only Ferris Manus himself knew the truth, and he kept that inside the locked cage of his memories. Do you believe such a warrior would allow himself to be undone by witchcraft? Do you believe he could be so weak? He asked. Dasan was shaking his head, trying to atone for a transgression he did not fully understand. No, sire. Get out. The words escaped Ferris's lips in a rasp. Before I throw you out. Dasan saluted and turned on his heel. Santar was about to join him when Ferris stopped him. Not you, First Captain. Santar stood his ground and straightened his back. Have I raised weak sons? Ferris asked when they were alone again. You know that is not the case. Then why are we confounded? The Primarch's collar cooled as he took to pacing his ruined stratagem. I've been away from the war front too long. My brother's draining my attention. You have become malleable, tractable. I perceive a weakness of purpose in our ranks, a failing of will that holds us back from our objective. Eldar's sorcery is not my concern. Finding and destroying the node is. We should have the mental fortitude to overcome tricks. I am leading this campaign and I will not be bested by my brothers. We are strength and example to all. The reputation of this legion, my reputation, will not be besmirched. No more delays. We press on at speed. Leave the army divisions behind if you must. Nothing must prevent us achieving victory. Santa frowned as he saw resolve turn to melancholy on Ferris's face. Desan serves you unshakably, as we all do. You have forged strong sons, my Primarch. Ferris relented. His hand was heavy and crushing as it fell upon the Ekri's shoulder. You make me temperate, Gabriel. I suspect you are the only one who can. Santal bowed his head respectfully. You honor me with your praise, my Primarch. It was well earned, my son. Ferris released him, leaving the shoulder numb beneath the guard. Dessen is a good soldier. I shall tell him you said so. No, I'll do it. Better come from me. As you wish, my Primarch. There was a long pause as Santar considered what he was about to say next. Ferris had his back to him again. Voice your concerns. My eyes might be cold, but they are not blind. Very well. Is it wise to abandon our auxiliaries? We might have need of their support. Ferris's head came around to regard his first captain swiftly. The Primarch's calm demeanor scorched to ash as something molten and unpredictable burned in his gaze. Are you questioning my orders, Aquari? Unlike his less experienced captain, Santar did not falter. No, Primarch, but you do not seem yourself. Anyone but Santar would have been struck for speaking so candidly. As it was, the first captain experienced a moment of disquiet as his Primarch considered his reaction. Santar's fists were clenched, the lightning claws poised for release as his warrior instincts took over. Ferris's fury ebbed as quickly as it had flared and he stared into the darkness. There's something I need to tell you, Gabriel. Ferris met the first captain's gaze. It is for you and only you to know, but I must confess it and I warn you, speak this to no one. An implicit threat lurked at the periphery of the Primarch's trailing words, and a nerve of tremor in Ferris's jaw flickered. The first captain waited patiently. I've had strange dreams of late. Ferris muttered. It was utterly unlike him to do so, and set Santa on edge more than any threat of violence ever could. Of a desert of black sand, and of eyes watching. Cold, reptilian eyes. Santa had no response. He had never seen his Primarch vulnerable before. Ever. Should I summon an apothecary, my lord? He eventually asked when he noticed Ferris rubbing his neck under the gorget. Just visible above the lip, the skin was raw. An irritation, nothing more. It is this place, this desert, and there's something out there. Now Santar felt a real concern and wanted to end the campaign in short order and venture to fresh theaters of war. The Legion can destroy the node unassisted. Flesh is weak, my Primarch. 
but we shall not be slaves to it. And like a shadow moving from across the sun, Ferris brightened and became his old self again. He clasped Santar's shoulder in a grip that was painful for the first captain. Muster the legionary captains. I will lead us to our enemies and show them how strong the sons of Medusa are. My course is set, Aquari. Nothing will stop me. Nothing. With Gabrielle Santal gone, Ferris returns to introspection. Nothing. Not even the promise of battle could shake his bleak mood. Like an anvil hung around his neck, it dragged him deeper towards an abyss. Fulgrim could lighten it. He was sure. But then, the Phoenician was not here. I have never been able to find a challenge amongst my own sons. Ferris remained as still as a mountain, as the Third Legion serfs clattered into the cage, pushing an arming dummy encased in Arkuduana's magnificent battle plate. Piece by piece they began unbuckling his training leathers, and drilling him into his war harnesses, ignored by the Primarch as he spoke. Even the Legion's ancients can only match me so far. I built this cage myself, for my brothers. Akaduana held out his arms, while his serfs machined on plate and engaged the seals. Then these bars could tell some stories. Fewer than you might think. My brothers are surprisingly reluctant. Akaduana's eyebrow arched. The armorers moved to his legs. Oh? Fulgrim would joke that he would die with shame, were his sons to see him defeated. Vulcan said that he did not want to hurt me. Me? I told him that I would make a finer weapon than that I gifted Fulgrim, and if he would try. And? And these bars have few stories to tell. But not none. Ferris's eyes glinted like daggers. His smile did not blunt their edge. I am honored, Lord. The armorers pulled and prodded at Akaduana's seals. The ranking surf work approached with his helmet. Akaduana waved him away. He was about to fight a Primarch, and he intended to savor it. I do you no honor. I know. Your birth father fought the Emperor. He did. My brother speaks highly of him. I know. He says you have no equal. Akaduana shrugged but felt a tingle of pride. Not so much in the fact as that it had been spoken by a Primarch. The Emperor's children boast many fine swordsmen. Ravash Kario has the potential to be great. And there is a brilliant young legionary in the second company called Lucius, who may yet reach my standard, if he can tear his face from the mirror. But they are not you. They are not me. I know how that feels. Akaduana pivoted around the waist, made some practice punches, testing the armorer's work. The power servos whined as he drew Timur and Athea. The serfs had rebelted his scabbards over his power armor, and the two Chanabral sabers emerged from their silks with the most expectant of sighs. An unmodified mortal at the farthest part of the hall would have felt it. Ferris's eyes flickered with self-hatred. Ferris Manus attacked before the command to begin had left his mouth. Given his Goliath physique, his speed was staggering. A lesser duelist than Akuduana would have been pulverized on the spot, and even he was forced into an admiring grasp as the smoldering metal fists thundered past his eyes. The Primarch was holding nothing back, and with a roar he came again. A thrilling combination of terror and exhalation filled Akaduana as he ducked between blows. Under them, away, fed by a lightness of heart he had not felt with a sword in his hand since the first time he had stood before Old Corinth. Before the unification had been won, Ferris bellowed and swung with his left. Akaduana bent under it and allowed it to clang into the bars. He rolled back, always back. He did not bother using his swords to parry. It would have been like blocking a bane blade. He ducked and weaved, danced and slid, slaws a blur of feint and misdirection. His movements were intuitive, faster than Jean and Hans thought, but compared to the gap between the audacious youngster and the grizzled thunder warrior, 
that between Legionary and Primarch was a yawning one. He grinned. He was going to have to try. With sheer, bludgeoning power, Ferris forced him up against the bars. His swords bit at the vulnerable points in the Primarch's armor. Ferris ignored them. Stings from a persistent insect. He fainted with Timo, drawing the Primarch's eyes, and then used the lengths of Athenia to stab at the Primarch's groin. The mastercrafted saber pierced the heavy mail, only to become wedged between a pair of crushed rings. Ferris gave a snarl and smacked the blade with his wrist. The ancient Grecan blade shattered, rune inscribed metal shards daggering the floor at Akudawana's feet. The force of the blow splintered his gauntlets, sent hairline fractures running up Akudawana's vambrace, and almost pulled his shoulder from its socket. He cried out in glee. Why do you laugh? Ferris drew back, even unarmed he had reach. Akudawana could only shrug, enfolding Timur in a two-handed grip. <laughs> because... Spitting with anger, Ferris drove his fist at Akudawana's chest. Too big to avoid. Too fast. He cried out in shock as his breastplate caved in, splitting the Palantine Aquila into frayed halves, gold leaf fluttering around the hot liloquence of Ferris's arm. Knuckles ground in, his rib plate cracked, then shattered. Before he had even registered the pain, he was flying, crashing into the bars with force enough to break more bones. The bars themselves were made of firmer stuff, built by Ferris' own hands to contain the might of a Primarch. They did not bend. Vibrating with a metallic basso profundo, they flung him back into the ring, sprawled on his chest and crying out for the pain of his fractured ribs. A great weight pushed into his shoulder, eliciting a murmur of pain, then closed over it to haul him up by the golden fretwork. Ferris's eyes burned into his, consumed them in his, his expression incandescent as he drew back his arm to deliver a finishing blow. I, too, once fought the Emperor. He is a greater being than you could imagine. How did your mortal father manage it? Akutuwana could barely see the fist before him. His eye had swollen. His face puffed and bloodied. He wished to give him every opportunity to yield. He gave a laugh, coughing it up in gurgles. Ferris frowned. Tell me why you laugh. Do you... do you not see? Ferris's grip tightened, a splintering of ceramite. Akutuwana chuckled, winced, and then chuckled again. This... <laughs> this, this is what we were born to do, both of us, to fight and eventually, one day, to lose. It feels good. Some of the aggression left Ferris's eyes. And one thing at least I was right. Our legions have much to learn from one another. He lowered Akudawana to the ground where the captain proceeded to fold bonelessly over his knees. What is now past was your war. What now commences shall be mine. There will be no feast of celebration, no proclamation of victory. I do not claim worlds. I conquer them. My victories are their own proclamation. I will present my brother Gilliman with ash around a barren star. That shall be my proclamation. And the Gardenelle shall forevermore be remembered only for the manner in which they fell. His gaze passed over his warriors, silent before his scorn. For what they had just witnessed was not a contest, it was a lesson. I have sought to lead as Fulgrim or Gilliman would have led, but that is not my way, and is not the Medusan way. The Gardenelle have had ample opportunity to yield. Grumbles of agreement swept the hall. Akutuwana swayed on the spot, blinking up at the Primarch, and it fell to Sirius to speak out. The Emperor desired these worlds intact. The Guardian rule over eleven worlds. I will give my father ten. 
The 413th expedition will not act in defiance of the Emperor. You are derelict, Chapter Master. Syria straightened against his wedged spear. I serve the Emperor of Terror, the ideals of his great crusade, my father and his brothers. In that sequence, I will not defy the first of my masters by ordering the destruction of Cardinal Prime. For a long time, Ferris glared down at the Ultramarine, and then a smile found its way across his face. Perhaps if you were the 413th, where you belong, then you would have known. You are no longer in command of the expedition, Valit. You, you do not have that authority. Gilliman can restore your command once he arrives. I'll be done with you by then. Until that happens, your orders come from Iron Father Moore. He knows what I expect of my warriors. I made that for Vulcan more than 150 years ago, said Ferris. So why is it still here? You know what Vulcan's like. He loves to work in the metal, and he doesn't trust anything that hasn't had the beat of a hammer laid upon it, or the fire of the forge in its heart. Ferris held up his shimmering, mercurial hands and said, I don't think he liked the fact that I could shape metal without heat or hammer. He returned it to me a while later, saying it should remain here with its creator. I think Nocturne's superstitions aren't as forgotten as our brother would have us believe. Fulgum reached up to touch the weapon, but curled his fingers into a fist before they touched the warm metal. To touch such a perfect weapon without firing it would be wrong. I understand that there is a certain attraction in a handsomely made weapon, but to apply such artistry to a thing designed to kill seems extravagant, said Fulgrim. Really? Chuckled Ferris, hefting Forgebreaker and pointing at a fire blade, sheathed at Fulgrim's hip. Then what were you doing in the Urals? Fulgrim drew his sword and turned it in his hands, so that it caught the light and threw dazzling red reflections around the forge. <laughs> that was a contest smiled Fulgrim. I didn't know you then, and I wasn't going to have you outdo me, was I? Ferris circled the Iron Forge, pointing his warhammer at the magnificent creations he had wrought and which hung upon the wall. There was nothing in weapons, machinery, or engineering devices that obliges them to be ugly. Ugliness is a measure of imperfection. You of all people should appreciate that. Then you... <laughs> Must be perfectly imperfect, said Fulgrim, his smile robbing the comment of malice. I leave being pretty to you and Sanguinius, my brother. I'll stick to fighting. Now come on, what's this all about? You speak of the future of the Great Crusade, and then want to talk of weapons in old times. What's going on? Fulgrim tensed suddenly anxious at what he was to ask of his brother. He had hoped to approach the matter circuitously, feeling out his brother's position and the likelihood of him joining them willingly. But with typical Medusan directness, Ferris managed to come right out and demanded to know his purpose. How artless and blunt. When did you last see the Emperor? Asked Fulgrim. The Emperor? What does that have to do with anything? Indulge me. When was it? A long time ago, admitted Ferris. Arena Septimus, on the crystal headlands above the acid oceans. I last saw him on Ulanor, at the Warmaster's coronation, said Fulgrim, moving towards the great anvil and trailing his fingers along the cold metal. I wept when he told us that he believed the time had come for him to leave the crusading work to his sons, and that he was returning to Terra to undertake a still higher calling. The Great Triumph, nodded Ferris sadly. I was on a campaign in the Kilar Nebula, and too far distant to attend personally. It is the one regret I have, not being able to say my farewells to our father. I was there, said Fulgrim his voice choked with emotion. I stood 
On the dais, next to Horus and Dorn, when the Emperor told us he was leaving. And it was the second most heartbreaking moment of my life. We begged him to stay, to see out what he had begun, but he turned his back on us. He, he would not even say what his great work was. Only that were he not to return to Terra, then all that we had won would crumble and fall into ruins. Ferris Manus looked up at him, his eyes narrowed. You talk as if he abandoned us. That was how it felt, said Fulgrim, his tone bitter. How it still feels. You said yourself that our father was returning to Terra, to preserve all that we had fought and bled for. Do you really think he would not have wanted to see the final victory of the Crusade? I don't know, said Fulgrim angrily. He could have stayed. What difference would a few years make? What could be so important that he had to leave us there and then? Ferris took a step towards him, and Fulgrim saw the reflection of his hurt anger in the mirrored eyes of his brother. The betrayal of everything he and the Emperor's children had fought for over the last two hundred years. I do not understand what you imply, Fulgrim, said Ferris, his words trailing off as the import of Fulgrim's earlier words came to him. What did you mean when you said it was the second most heartbreaking moment of your life? What could be greater than that? Fulgrim took a deep breath, knowing that he would have to come flat out and say what he had come to say. What could be greater than that? When Horus told me the truth of how the Emperor had betrayed us and planned to cast us aside in his quest for godhood, said Fulgrim, relishing the horrified expression of surprise and fury on his brother's face. Fulgrim! shouted Ferris. What in terror is wrong with you? Betrayed us? Godhood? Fulgrim took quick steps to stand before Ferris Manus, his voice passionate now that he had taken the final step and confessed his true reasons for coming here. Horus has seen the truth of things, my brother. The Emperor has already abandoned us and even now plots his apotheosis. He lied to us all, Ferris. We were nothing more than tools to win back the galaxy in preparation for his ascension. The perfect being he pretended to be was a filthy lie. Ferris pushed him off and backed away, his ruddy, craggy features pale and horrified. Knowing he had to press on, Fulgrim said, Others have already seen the truth of this and are moving to join Horus. We will strike before the Emperor is even aware that his designs have been unmasked. Horus will reclaim the galaxy in the name of those whose blood was spent to conquer it. Fulgrim wanted to laugh as the words spilled from him, the thrill of finally unburdening himself almost too great to stand. The breath heaved in his lungs, and he could not tell whether the thundering he could hear was the blood surging in his skull, or the hammers of faraway forges. Ferris Manus shook his head, and Fulgrim despaired as he saw his brother's horror turning to fury. This is the new direction of the crusade you spoke of. Yes, cried Fulgrim. It will be a glorious age of perfection, my brother. What we have won is already being given away to imperfect mortals who will waste the glories we have won for them. What we have earned in blood and tears will be ours again. Can't you see that? Oh, I see his betrayal, Fulgrim, roared Ferris Manus. You are not talking about claiming back what we have won. You are talking about betraying everything we stand for. My brother, implored Fulgrim. Please, you must listen to me. The Mechanicum has already pledged its support to the War Master, as have many of our brothers. War is coming. War that will engulf this galaxy in flames. When it is over, there will be no mercy for those on the wrong side. He saw the color flood back into his brother's face, a raw and bellicose red that he knew all too well. Ferris, I beg you, 
for the sake of our brotherhood to join us. Brotherhood, bellowed Ferris. Our brotherhood died when he decided to turn traitor. Fulgrim backed away from his brother as he saw the murderous intent in his blazing silver eyes. Angrod is ready to strike, and Mortarion will soon be with us. You must join me, or you will be destroyed. No, snarled Ferris Manus, hefting Forgebreaker to his shoulder. It is you who will be destroyed. Ferris, no, pleaded Fulgrim. Think about this. Would I come to you like this if I did not believe that it was the right thing to do? I don't know what's happened to you, Fulgrim, but this is treachery and there is only one fate for traitors. So you, you are going to kill me? Ferris hesitated, and Fulgrim saw his shoulders sag in despair. I am your sworn honor, brother, and I swear to you that I do not lie, pressed Fulgrim hoping that there was still a chance to convince his brother not to act in haste. I know you're not lying, Orgrim. And that's why you have to die! These are not my hands. This fact is forgotten by my brothers. Inexplicably, it has always seemed to me. The hands are strong, to be sure, and have created great things for us all. But they are not mine, and that counts for something. They forget that the silver on my arms comes from a beast that I vanquished. It is the mark of a great evil that I ended, and yet it persists within me. I would struggle to remove it now, and I will not remove the silver from my flesh, because I have learned to depend on it. The fault is with my mind. I rely on the augmentation given to me by the metal gauntlets, so much so that the flesh beneath them is now little more than a distant memory. A day will come when I will strip it from me, lest I lose the power to master myself forever. Already my legion's warriors replace their shield hands with metal in my honor, and so they too are learning to doubt the natural strength of their bodies. They must be weaned off this practice before it becomes a mania for them. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. So I record it here. When the time comes, I will strip my hands of their unnatural silver. I will instruct my legion to recant their distrust of the flesh. I will turn them away with the gifts of the machine and bid them relearn the mysteries of the flesh bone and blood. When my father's crusade is over, it shall be my sacred task. When the fighting is done, I shall cure my legion and myself, for fighting is all there is. If we may never pause to reflect on what such devotion to strength is doing to us, then our compulsion will only grow. Bow to it, he said, handing the slate back. It will be quicker. The man slowly offered him the bloody saw, but Shadrach had already leaned over the side of the recliner and drawn his gladius. He set the edge of the blade along the clumsy guide cut that the bone saw had scored, paused, and then struck his ruined hand off with a single swift blow. It bounced off the side of the trolley and landed in the pool of blood on the deck. The surf hesitated, as though he felt it would be polite to pick up the severed hand and return it to Shadrach. Then he remembered himself, dropped the saw, and hurried forward to attend with clamps and wadding. If it's going to hurt anyway, said Shadrach, as the man worked, binding the stump tightly. It's better that it doesn't linger too. Good advice, he thought, applies to so damned much. Gorgonson returned an hour later and inspected the wound. Do this yourself. It seemed for the best. Shadrach replied. You're no surgeon, said Gorgonson. Never claimed to be, but your man there was intent on whittling me down until I was nothing but a spinal column and a rictus. Gorgonson frowned. We're doing the best we can, given the circumstances. Well, 
He made more of a mess of me in ten minutes than the damn sons of Horus could manage in a week. Gorgonson glared at him. Don't even joke. Damn you, Shadrach. Don't even say the words aloud. You don't think I'm angry? I'm beyond rage. I'm in another place entirely. White heat and boiling blood. I'm going to butcher and burn every one of the bastards. Give me my new hand so I can get on with it. Gorgonson hesitated. They had known each other for 24 decades. Like Shadrach, Goran Gorgonson had been a stormwalker, a son of terror. They had fought through the unification wars side by side. At their ascendancy, Goran had elected to join Lokopt, the clan that most remembered and celebrated the Terran aspect of the founding. But he had changed his name to Gorgonson, in honor of the Primarch. Anger's not going to get us anywhere, Earth Brother, Shadrach said quietly. Except deader than we are already. Anger's a blindfold, a fool's motivation. I reserve it only for killing blows. We need cool heads and clear minds. This is survival, repair, rebuilding. Terra only knows we're good at repair. We excel at it. So this should play to our strengths. They're calling a council. Who's they? The clan fathers. A clan council? Well, what in Terra's name for? This isn't a matter of bloodline and heritage. The clan fathers are proposing to assume command. The clan fathers are proposing to assume command. Collective command. I suppose so. In the absence of... Gorgonson paused. There were words that were going to be hard to say. Names that were going to be hard to utter. The clan fathers take control for now. Isn't there comfort and assurance in that? They are veterans who understand. A clan council is the last thing we need, said Shadrach. Command by committee, pointless. We need positive, singular leadership. I didn't know you had aspirations of command, Gorgonson remarked. Shadrach thought about that for a moment. The notion came as a surprise. I don't. I've never considered it. I just know we need something now. Someone. We're dead without it. Just a shattered rabble. Gorgonson sighed. Any apothecary, even the best of us, will tell you that you can graft on a new hand, but you can't graft on a new head. Then we'll have to learn how, said Shadrach. A servitor besides Gorgonson was holding the augmetic on a tray. Nothing fancy, said the apothecary, reaching for a scraper a neurofuser. I have no juvenile packing left either, so you'll have to let it bond by itself. Don't test it, it'll be weak. For months, probably. Let it bed in and heal. Shadrach nodded. Just fix me up. I'm sure I'll have many weeks of calm and leisure to get the healing done. Gorgonson started working. Is he dead? Yes. You know this. Amadeus told me. It was confirmed from the surface. Lord Commander Amadeus is dead too, murmured the apothecary. Yes, I saw it, but his word lives. The Gorgon is dead, and our stepfather Amadeus is gone too. So we can lie down and die with them, or we can learn the graft heads. What are you playing at? Org asked. Shadrach could feel the Iron Father's anger radiating out like a force field. They stood on the caustic shoreline of the Sulphur Lake. Acid vapor swirled like battlefield smoke. What? We bite our lips now? Even now, in this predicament? Sorgal has no clan father here. You shame us in the company of- I shame you. Shadrach shook his head. Is that really what matters now? The shame of speaking out? Fates above, we are shamed enough. The clan leaders are groping around, trying to recover something we have lost forever. By the time they reach a decision, we will be discovered and slaughtered. Or, if they reach a decision, it will be the wrong one, and we will be slaughtered anyway. We need unification, Shadrach, said Org. For morale alone. I agree, but under one war leader, with one purpose. One leader. Ork laughed bitterly. 
Who? You, perhaps. Orc spat and looked away. No one wants it. None of us. Not a single captain. Not a single Iron Father. That's why the Clan Fathers have taken the lead. They are projecting a sense of security, of unity through our blood heritage. A reassurance in this time of loss through the bonds of fraternity. But it's a group decision so that no one shoulders a burden alone. No one bloody wants it. That's why no one has stepped forward and called the rally around him. He looked at Org. No one wants to be seen as trying to replace the Gorgon. No one wants to replace Amadeus Duquesne. No one wants to be seen as that impertinent or disrespectful. I understand it. He paused. But we need to raise the storm again. No one wants the command. No one wants to appear so arrogant as to imagine that he can assume the Primarch's role. But it's not a matter of want, or pride, or vainglorious ambition. It's a matter of necessity. This talk will get you killed, Terranborn, said Org. No! Shadrach snapped, pointing towards the monastery. That talk will get us killed. He lowered his hand. The augmented graft had not fully healed, and still ached abysmally. The violence of the gesture had jarred it. I have it on good medical authority that you can't graft on a new head, he said. Jebez Org uttered a dry laugh. He shifted his flesh spare frame and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. You don't need to be a medical authority to know that, he replied. I'm not suggesting that anyone pretends to be the Gorgon. I'm not proposing that anyone presumes he can command as well as Ferris Manus, or attempt to be such a master. I'm simply talking about focus of authority. One mind, one will, one iron drive, strong enough to compel us long enough to... To what? Do what needs to be done. Which is what? Survive? No. Shadrach looked out over the misted lake. He turns to the Iron Father. You can't graft on a new head, but you can cut off an existing one. We need to focus long enough to get to Horus, to cut off his head. We decapitate the traitors. We do to them what they did to us. We shatter them and scatter them to the winds. We end this treachery. After a moment, he added, Then we can die. For all I care. I am not used to repeating myself, Primaris Deck Officer Vakul. This frigate is now under the auspices of the Iron Hands. It is currently interfering with my mission and will move aside. I demand to see the Lord Praetor. A rumble of hidden gears caused Kratos to turn in the same direction. In time to see the huge portal rumbling open, and a blaze of light from the adjoining flight deck flooding between the receding doors. Twenty figures were silhouetted against the dark, far bulkier than any normal space marine. As his eyes adjusted, Kratos recognized the Terminator armor, but unlike anything he had seen in a long time. The warplate of the Terminators was far broader and taller than standard legionary power armor, and these had an exoskeletal frame carrying slanted plates of extra armor, all decorated in the dark green livery of the Salamanders. Their hands were fashioned in a variety of powered fists, claws, and chain blades designed for close combat, anti-armor assault, and bulkhead cutting and in the right they carried an assortment of weapons ranging from simple combi bolters to triple barreled autocannons, plasma charges, and rocket launchers, and one carried an immensely rare, long-muzzled Volkite culverin. Yet it was not these amendments that amazed Kratos. The Iron Hands had numerous experimental suits of Terminator armor, with modified heavy weaponry and ablative shields. What stole the curse from Kratos' lips was the additional weapon systems mounted across the backpacks and shoulders of the Terminators. A plethora of armor-piercing missiles, las cannons, 
multi-melters and conversion beamers were all pointing in his direction. Each was quite literally a walking tank. The voice of R.E.E. emanated from the external vocalizer of the lead warrior. Spearhead Centurion Kratos, welcome aboard the Hearthfire. These suits were designed by Vulcan himself, and we were about to transit them to the surface of Istvan when the massacre began. The Primarch gave me a direct order not to allow them to fall into the hands of the traitors, hence our swift departure. Arie swung first to the left, and then to the right, looking at the row of warriors behind him. You mentioned something about trying to take my ship from me. If the situation had not been so fraught, Arie might have enjoyed the moment of hesitation before Kratos reluctantly raised his hand in salute and bowed his head to the approaching Pyre Warden. The Salamander's commander had not intended to humiliate his counterpart in this fashion. It had been happenstance that Kratos had launched his ridiculous coup as Arie and the others were about to board their gunships in the neighboring launch bay. I expect you to return to the Forsyth immediately. Arie raised his powered fist and pointed to the storm strike. And take your legionaries with you. What a waste, replied the Centurion. He waved a hand at the Terminators, shaking his head slowly. Vulcan entrusted you with his work, and this is how you use it? Even of these armored suits, you cannot take the World Eater's fortress alone. Be thankful that there will be nothing for the enemy once I have annihilated the city after your deaths. It is not the armor or weapon that makes the warrior. It is the spirit. You will fail. Your sentimentality will be your undoing. The flesh is weak. I have heard you say that phrase on several occasions since our first encounter. I am not sure that you really understand what it means. You may have spoken with the Gorgon, but do not think to school me in the teachings of my own Primarch. What you say, the flesh is weak, is only part of the saying. In forgetting the end, you have lost the meaning. Vulcan said it in praise of Ferris Manus after the 184th expedition when our legions jointly liberated the orc-dominated worlds of the Shokshua Cluster. The fighting had been fiercer than anything we had expected. Your Primarch said in jest that his arm was tired from killing so many orcs, and Vulcan retorted with, The flesh is weak, but deeds endure. It was a celebration of what they had achieved, and a remark that even Primarchs can die, but what they do will last beyond their lifespan. It was a message of humility, not condemnation. Flesh is weak because it knows it must come to an end, and so we must rise above the concerns of flesh and leave a legacy that others will be proud to inherit. Ferris Manus understood that. He was a harsh master, an unforgiving ally, but he was also a maker of things. A builder, not a destroyer. Kratos stepped back, shocked by Ari's words. In a moment he had recovered, his confusion quickly turning to irritation. Another lecture. It doesn't matter what you say. The only thing you're going to leave behind on Prastes are corpses. Kratos spun away, shouting for his men to embark onto the gunship. He followed them up the ramp and paused. At the top he looked back with the last shake of the head. Ari returned to his warriors and ordered the launch bay sealed again as they lined up to board the dropships. Ari looked up and saw dark blurs descending towards the ground. Torpedoes, he muttered, not quite believing Kratos had finally acted. Even the Terminator suits would be no defense against the ordnance designed to breach the hulls of battleships. If it spelled the end for the Salamanders, it also heralded destruction for the World Eaters. Ari contented himself with the thought that had he not taken out the shield generator, the Forces would be using mass drivers and anti-ship missiles rather than pinpoint laser strikes. There would be deaths in the city, but far fewer because of the Salamander's actions. 
The quiet, confident voice of Veshtar broke through the fog of confusion and disappointment that clouded Ari's thoughts as he watched the dark smudges glowing larger above the citadel. Those aren't torpedoes. Pinpricks of fire became recognizable, flares of retro rockets firing. The torpedoes resolved into drop pods, several dozen of them, as they slammed into the rockcrete of the killing ground. Some petaled open discharging flurries of explosive warheads that slashed bloody holes through the world eaters, slave soldiers. Squads of legionary warriors poured from others, bolts, plasma, and laser fire adding to the torrent of deadly fire. A second wave of larger craft hit the ground a few seconds later, their armored skin shed by explosive charges to reveal predator tanks, vindicator siege tanks, and a dreadnought. The salamanders parted to allow the Iron Hand's armor to form an attacking lance, pointed directly towards the inner fortifications. Lasers, whirlwind missiles, autocannon shells and a storm of other ordnance converge on the keep, lighting it with dozens of detonations and slicing beams. A predator tank slewed to a halt beside R.E.E., and he looked up to see the command hatch in the blocky turret flip open, helmetless. Spearhead Centurion Kratos emerged from the inside of the tank. He raised a fist to his forehead, and then he cupped his hands to shout down over the din of the growling engines, and the crash of the citadel wall falling under the bombardment. Your flank is secured. Push forward, Lord Praetor. I should not have doubted the strength we gained from righteous conviction. Let us leave a worthy legacy together. My thanks for setting me back on the right path. Deeds endure. It wasn't good enough. His body was weak. He had always known, but attachment to flesh had made him resistant to the action required. His encounter with Lidric had provided the final push he needed. He assumed that his friend had returned to his own ship, possibly sharing an orbit somewhere on the other side of the blockade, but in a way that no longer mattered. In the photo bleach color blotches that floated out of reach, above his flesh eye he saw the red eyes of Captain Hasrid, closer to him than the ceiling lumens were now. Part of him recoiled from the memory, but he made himself face it. The son of Korax, a death spectre he had later learned, having made inquiries of the cross scythe emblem with the Commandant's Imager archives, had come upon him completely unawares. If he had been hostile, then Stronos would be dead. Add to that his humbling before the Iron Council and his wayward actions on Thenos, and it showed a pattern of behavior that demonstrated his fault. The Eye was an obvious target. It nagged him for decades and his replacement was an important step on his drive towards perfection. That had simultaneously deferred actions on the aspirations Lydric had cast against the Adeptus Mechanicus, he had noted and deemed incidental. Any action he might take now would be suspect in any event. For all he had been discomforted at first, he found that he craved the surety of the clan Interlink now. He desired the strength of his brother's will to brace his own. The flesh was weak. The bright metal cabinets fitted against the bulkheads rattled as someone entered. His first thought was that it was Haas, wheeling in a Churisurical trolley, but again his senses fell below expectation. It was Ares. The dreadnought towered over the stowed instrumentarium the restricted space making his heavy armored frame appear even more massive. His blocky torso pivoted as if to survey the room, thoroughly before entering. His optic slips appeared to alight upon Stronos, only by chance. Is Stronos injured? Stronos considered the silence, but decided that he could keep nothing from the ancient. I am defective. I seek to rectify that. How so? The Raven's son proved himself my superior. I must improve and adapt. Improve and adapt? 
We recall a time when Iron Hands were less like Christos, and more like Card and Stronos. They were ruthless, yes, but adaptable. Not slaves to Capulus. You should have said as much before the Eye of Medusa. Stronos returned, bitterly, his gaze fixed to the ceiling plating. Darsic, cast our vote as we saw right. Our word would have made no difference. When you first stood before me, you declared the Iron Council would feel your wrath for their failure to hold Thanos. Your fury was sound. What became of it? Such strength of feeling is difficult to hold on to. In time, perhaps, Stronos will know this too. Stronos scowled. The facial twitch lengthened the visual wavelength, from infrared to microwave. The power conduits buried within the ceiling above his cot became a shadowy smear of crimson. You believed the decision of the Council to be errant, yet you left the argument to Verox. From each according to his ability, said Ares. It sounded like a quotation. Verox is passionate and persuasive, even when two brick wore flesh in place of iron. The Verdamma thought primitive. Now we wonder if they are not the sole champions of the Iron Creed, as once we knew it. Shwanos turned his head to regard the Dreadnought. The metal roundels of his forechain bumped against the pallet, and he resisted the urge to touch the augmetic vertebrae, suddenly bitterly angry. Irrelevant! All of it irrelevant! The Iron Council is ruled. It is clearly our decision-making that is an error, not theirs. I will not weaken my brothers by standing alongside them in this imperfect state. We feel that we should experience contempt for such self-delusion, yet we find that we cannot care. How far from our father's likeness we have both fallen. Haas re-entered by another door. You are beyond my skills to restore, venerable, said the apothecary, bluntly, as a headless servitor pushed a Medicaid trolley and a whippish thing in crimson robe squeezed through the already cramped quarters. The Magos Biologist rolled up long sleeves and rubbed his hands with counterseptic jelly, while the servitor maneuvered around Stronos' bedside, its trolley rattling carelessly over the tension. With respect, Iron Father, your presence here serves no purpose. He waited a moment during which Ares offered a blank wall by way of reply, and then added, You take up space. Leave. The Christosian question makes all matters subject to doubt. Stronos said to Ares, voice low. All will be as it once was, once the arguments are resolved. Ares turned from the apothecary to him. His emptiness seemed for a moment sorrowful. Pardon Stronos speaks of the arguments, but what does he know of the question? For there is only one. Stronos made to formulate an answer, only to realize he had none. Often he had railed against the waste of energy that the Conclave brought on the Iron Council, but had never found the time to learn for himself what, in effect, it was all for. He shook his head honestly. He had been built to be a war machine. This round voyage to Medusa was the first time since his novitation that he had not been either in the thick of a war zone, or in transit from one to another. Better to leave questions of doctrine to the tech priests and the Iron Fathers, said Haas, moving to Stronos' pallet, and the waiting servitor even as he spoke. At the mention of his order, the Magos looked up, but did not interrupt. Stronos frowned at the mortal, for every Iron Hand warrior on Medusa and scattered across the Imperium, there were thousands of servitors, menials and adepts of the Adeptus Mechanicus to service their needs. Noticing his regard, the adept quickly looked away. Stronos found himself wondering what else the unseen legions on which the chapter so depended might see and hear. A non-verbal burst of scorn rang from Ares' vocalizer. And you call yourselves men of iron? You who cede all free will to others and pull its strength. Do you even know how the Conclave began? I know little of Christos beyond his role of honours, said Stronos, stung. 
I know that he was once considered an exemplar of the Iron Creed. As it is now interpreted for you, perhaps. What do you mean by that? Demanded Hans. Ares did not answer directly. It began on Columbus. Everyone knows that. Haas said, dismissively, then picked up a spoon-headed implement from his Medicaid trolley and bent toward Stronos. And what happened there to cause such crisis? Ares countered. Stronos couldn't answer. He looked to Haas. The apothecary let out a frustrated sigh and said nothing, focusing instead on Stronos' eye. He had no answer either. Stow thy leeches, apothecary. There is to be no bloodletting today. Ares backed out of the Chirogiacal Bay and into the main space of the Apothecarian. With some reluctance, Shona sat up on his pallet and pushed Apothecary Haas from him. Come, Cardan. We will show you what happened that day.